agenda uh, this morning. We have a quorum. Um, so just advise members that throughout the meeting, if you can maintain your social distancing. Um, throughout this morning, we will consider the following business, subordinate legislation. We'll have a briefing from taxi operators, a briefing from NIE on infrastructure for a green recovery, and then we have departmental briefing on roads procurement and major projects. No, no apologies, and there's no chairman's business. Moving then to our draft minutes of item three, page six. That's for the meeting of the 2nd of December. Do members have any issues? Are you content? Great. Content. Um, item four, which matters uh, arising at page 14, and they're from the meeting of the 2nd of December also. Um, if you have any issues, um, you can let me know. No content. Um, at page 19, we have outstanding committee requests for information. Um, committee staff obviously keep an eye on that and send reminders where appropriate. Um, moving then to correspondence. Um, that's item 5. Um, that's from page 33 onwards. At page 33, there is um, a grid there really of actions if members are content with that um, if you have any issues um, we've always seen correspondence at page 76 from right bus and rise and although it is in our park um, this is this should be treated as private and confidential because it is um, part of their the business case so if, you, if members would be mindful, mindful of that that information just whenever you are referring to it or um, particularly if you were going to share it I would I would caution against that although that said there is some information on that which is very useful for your understanding in relation to the whole piece around hydrogen so just to bear that in mind um, at page 156 we have um, information with regards to road safety strategy um, it, the current one is now going to be extended for six months um, Officials were to come to brief us today, but obviously um, other business, and so we're unable to attend. I suppose what is disappointing is that this is still being it's been pushed on further down, down the line. Um, so that this will be something that we'll want to come back to. Sure, I asked that specific question, and I'm very confidently told here at the committee that things were going to be tidied up pretty quickly, and I think it was going to be with us by November. That's not that long ago. No, I suppose we do have to bear in mind everything that has gone on, um, particularly around COVID and so on. But at the same time, it is disappointing that really up until the last moment that we were under the impression that more work was going to be done on this. Um, do members have any other comments with regards to that? I'm glad to see it's not just the TEO committee because sometimes... <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, I would agree with Mr. Hildish and yourself. And you know, the announcement was made recently in relation to the hundred schools for getting the twenty miles an hour. But we need to know what's the overall strategy in relation to this, because people are obviously have been excluded from that, and we don't really have a road safety strategy for the future. So, we really, do need to see some progress in this. And as um, Mr. Hildish said, there was you know, clear assurances given that we would have a clear strategy. There has to be consultation and everything around this. So it's going to take time. It's going to take quite a lot, of, uh, much longer, probably, than we Ms. Kimmins. Sorry, Chair. Yeah, um, just in, in relation to that, I suppose, and it ties in with some of the other correspondence there. It, have we had a response from SUSTRANS yet? Um, I'd ask them if they could provide the list of schools identified, you know, as requiring road crossings urgently. So, because I think that actually would tie in with, with some of the road strategy stuff as well, road safety strategy stuff as well. Sorry. Quite a lengthy response from Sustrans at last for last week was tabled at last week's meeting. Um, it may not have actually contained all the information that we needed with regards to schools, but certainly it was quite lengthy with regards to school streets and various other um, campaigns that they were involved in. Um, so maybe if we review that correspondence and then um, if there is anything that we want to pick up with regard, particularly around that, we can we can certainly write to them. Members are agreed. Um, Ms. Anderson? Yeah, I, I just saying that in a few of the committees, I'm in the TEO committee, and you know, you're know you finding at the last minute you're hearing that either um, officials have already come forward, haven't come forward, or you're getting papers 
just too late to be able to read. For instance, if I got a paper, uh, a table paper for the TEO committee and I'm in this committee, I, I can't get a chance to read it. So there seems to be a pattern across different departments. Uh, we took a stand at the TEO committee last week and says we weren't going to tolerate this. You know, we're not going to have late papers or being told at the last minute that officials aren't turning up because it, it really messes about with the schedule. And I think that all of the chairs of the different committees would be worth having a conversation about this because it's not just happening in this committee, it's happening in other committees as well. Something we'll raise at the LG. Um, um, other information, obviously at page 196, we have a response um, from the Minister um, regarding a, a number of issues that were raised at the committee meeting on the 18th of November. I suppose I'll just um, draw your attention to um, the comments in relation to the planning review at page 198, 99. Um, where she's saying, I do not consider there's a problem to bring forward a solution to preempt any problems which may arise or for an urgent amendment to underpin the primary legislation. That's obviously in relation to the plan planning review. Um, now we have sought our own um, legal advice with regards to that. Do we know when that's likely to be with later us? Later on this week or early next. Um, but that's obviously quite clear then from from the Minister in respect of that. In many respects, the committee has raised their concerns, although it was late in how we received that information. But at least we've, um, in some ways, we've kind of highlighted it um, and sort of underlined it again. And members, uh, any other comments with regards to that correspondence? Henry Correspondence, Ms. Anderson. Yeah, your mic's very low. I don't know if it's on. Just to say the okay. Thank you. So that was just in relation to the planning review. Okay. The minister's content. Members, any other issues they want to highlight from correspondence? Content. Okay. Um, okay. At table page, at table papers at page five, we have the interim report from the examiner of statutory rules, um, highlighting um, two SRs. Um, do you thought? 2020-258, the Kelly Valley Road, um, Garva, Abandonment Order Northern Ireland 2020, and 2020-265, the Seago Industrial Street, Kagavan Abandonment Order. Um, we agreed these statutory rules subject to the examiner's report. She is now advised that she will not draw special attention of the Assembly to either of those in the report. You're content then that we will um, action Correspondence as agreed in, in the memo. Okay, moving then to item six, which is SL1, the regulation EC number 1370, um, 2007, public services obligations and transport, um, revocation EU exit Northern Ireland regulations 2020. Mm. And you'll find that at page 200. And 44. Um, the proposals are subject to negative resolution procedure. Regulations are required in response to recent legal advice, which advises that where directly applicable EU regulations are covered by the Northern Ireland Protocol, they cannot be amended by domestic legislation. Instead, the contents and details of the revoked regulations will take the form of guidance on how the EU regulations are to be read in their application and operation in Northern Ireland. And we have Graham Banks with us this morning, you're very welcome, um, from the department, um, just to talk us through that. So if you could just sort of give us an, the rationale behind this and, and how okay. we're in this situation. Sure. Um, so to give you a bit of the background, um, initially these regulations formed part of a statutory instrument through Westminster. They were being progressed around about this time last year. Uh, <laughs> prior to the Assembly coming, uh, reconvening in January, February this year. So we're in a situation where these were being made through Westminster. Uh, on return of ministers, uh, the min Minister Mallon took the decision that she would prefer for these regulations to be, the 1370 regulations, to be made through the Assembly. Uh, so that, that's fine. Uh, officials progressed that separate set of, of regulations based on the legal advice that we had at the time, which was the, uh, a requirement to retain uh, EC Regulation 1370-2007, which is a state aid uh, exemption which provides uh, the opportunity to provide, uh, fund TransLink through a public service agreement. So 
On the basis of that legal advice and the Minister's decision, officials progressed a set of regulations which came to committee in, I think, towards the end of October, start of November. Um, those were, were, were uh, made, I think, uh, just a few weeks ago. Now, there has been changes in the Departmental Solicitor's Office uh, over the last uh, couple of months, and the new Departmental Solicitor for Department for Infrastructure noted that there was a potential error in law with the, the retention of 1370 in domestic statute, and that it wasn't um, compatible with the protocol. On notifying the department at the end of November, we uh, very quickly got together a set of revoking regulations, which uh, you see the, the SL1 before you today. Uh, that will revoke the regulations that we made just a few weeks ago. The purpose of that will allow Regulation 1370 to continue to apply through the Northern Ireland Protocol. That, uh, that is the vehicle in which it will flow into domestic law from, from the European Union. Ms. Anderson. Uh, Chair, you know that I had concerns throughout this process around these SRs because once we were told they were technical, um, at every meeting that we were coming uh, across us and you did question, you actually sent one back uh, to, to get it interrogated further. Um, and I just find that we're getting this illegal advice um, on November the 25th, where we were told that all of the SRs that we were passing were of a technical nature, even though we weren't satisfied that they were all just technical and that there would be some uh, changes, particularly in line with the protocol and what that was, uh, what that was meaning for us. And we passed them in good faith because we were getting assurance when we even uh, questioned them back as to why that was the case. So I feel that we're in a vulnerable situation after having passed them in good faith in the knowledge that what was given to us, that these were only technical, weren't going to have an impact on the, the protocol or any other agreement, regardless of anybody's view of all of that, so long as we were doing due diligence and we were scrutinising them. And I, and I don't feel that, that we got the proper information. And because there was a change um, at your own end with regards to the legal advisers, um, that was advising the department. I think it has left us uh, in a difficult situation. The one thing that I would say, Chair, that you did um, question as to whether the information that we were receiving was accurate. Uh, uh, to, to the knowledge of the officials at the time, working on the, the basis of the legal advice that we had, the information was accurate that these regulations were required. Um, on the point of whether or not it's a technical amendment, it was a technical amendment. It was to retain the, the existing European uh, Communities Regulation 1370, as, as it was, but correcting inoperables um, within, uh, within the, the retained legislation, uh, removing references to uh, European institutions. Um, the fact that it's in the protocol means that uh, those, um, th those amendments, while not required in law, uh, in terms of the operation, guidance will have to be given to those making use of that, that set of regulations as to how to read those inoperables. So the, the, the overall policy impact is, is, is negligible. Well, I, I think, to be honest with you, I don't feel as a member of this committee that it's for ourselves to be feeling that it's uh, ne negligible insofar as we passed this in the understanding that this was compatible with the protocol. That, Regard, was a, that, that was, that was that the legal and, advice behind yeah, it at the time. And, and obviously now we're being told no, um, that, that the SR is not compatible. Um, and we're having to, I, I'm just wondering, what about the other SRs in relation to Brexit? Um, is it worth re-examining any of those so that we made the decision based on the advice that was given at that time? And the changes um, in terms of the regulations are to be changed to guidance? So that those who are operating they will know how to do that. What does that mean in terms of enforceability of its guidance, as opposed to a regulation? And, and this is this is the, the complexity of um, inoperables and directly applicable European Union legislation. Um, there are certain requirements in terms of how how that those sets of regulations are read with respect to references to. Um, for instance, the European Union or a European Union member state, uh, Northern Ireland will no longer be a member of the European Union at the end of the transition period. 
However, re without retaining the legislation which was in the original set of regulations, how do, how do you then read references to a European Union member state if this applies in Northern Ireland? And this is where the, the, the guidance will clarify that sort of, of, of technical issue. And can, and can we assume that um, other pieces have actually been <coughs> reviewed and are fine, and this is the only one that requires revocation? As, as far as I'm aware, this is the only one that, that requires revocation at this time. Uh, the, the Departmental Solicitor, as I mentioned, uh, has changed. The, to the best of my knowledge, they've undertaken a review of the regulations that have went through over the, the last four or five months since they came into post, and uh, this is the only one they've found where there has been an issue. Could we be satisfied that just that that is the case? I know you're saying as far as you're aware, but could, could you go back just and ask the question uh, so, so that we know that, and will we get the information about the guidance before the 31st of December? We we're having a briefing next week, so that might be something that we may be able to explore at okay. that stage. Okay, Mr. Beggs. I have to say I, I'm, I'm very concerned with what is being proposed. Essentially, you're proposing to remove uh, an entire set of regulations and pass it to someone else to let them decide, and that will remove all potential democratic scrutiny in further decision making. When I read the uh, document that's referred to. I, I found online that this was changed in May, 11th of May, uh, made in 11th of May coming, went before Parliament the 13th of May, uh, and applicable since then in the rest of the United Kingdom. I am shocked that it's been so late before issues have come here, and now you say you want to abandon the legislation which governs public transport passenger services by rail and by bus. It governs its contracts. It governs uh, transfer of um, undertakings, protection of employment, quite a lot of activity, and you're asking us to revoke all that and pass this to someone else who we don't know how uh, they will engage with any democratic forum. And in my opinion, this breaches all the principles that were established uh, in, in the Belfast Agreement and the, a normal democratic forum. So I personally am unhappy and uh, would not be supporting. Uh, there's a number of points there. On, on the point of ab abandoning, abandoning uh, the, the, the legislation, um, it's, in terms of the, the, the legal situation, it, when, if these regulations are revoked, uh, the, the EC regulation will, will be maintained in uh, domestic statute, and it will flow into the domestic statute uh, as a result of the Withdrawal Agreement Act. So, the, uh, the, the mechanisms for funding TransLink will be maintained. Um, there will be references to European Union law on the protection of, of employment and uh, how, how that will be governed. So, I, I, there's no question of, a, of abandoning the legislation. It's, uh, it's around where that legislation sits, and it will be uh, maintained as European uh, Union legislation, which flows into domestic statute as a result of the Withdrawal Agreement Act rather than as retained EU law. Is this really about a pretense that we've left Europe when we really we haven't, that we're still governed by the European regulations? It's, uh, it's, it's captured by the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, that is what's been, what's been agreed as part of the, the, the bar agreement. Okay, Mr Boylan. Thanks, Chair. And Chair, I've been mentioning this from day one and said, every time we asked, they said it was technical. So let's strip it back, Graham. Small region member state, we've now left Europe. Okay, don't mind the issue of technical issues transfer from European responsibility <coughs> to departmental responsibility. That's 100 per cent. Where the problem lies is cross reference and what we want to agree from Europe in terms of directives and derogations and all that goes with it. Cross reference that with the protocol itself. Now, we should have known, to be honest. I know you said. There's a new uh, legal solicitor in or whatever you'd legal advise with. The issue for us, we, we, we've, rea we've raised this issue on a number of occasions. Make sure we get that. So there seems to be an issue now for us. Because we don't know exactly what SRs have gone past the annulment phase and what this committee actually can do in most cases. 
Um, you need to reassure the committee that we're going down the right route here because we've taken legal advice. And now we're saying we've changed. So that's the simplification of all. And I appreciate what Mr. Beggs has said. But we either agree those and going to follow those European regulations that we agree with, depending how whatever operations they roll out. But we have a problem here as a committee. If we were ever to challenge any of those, that time frame, we need to seek legal advice again this as a committee to see we're right or wrong in all of this here. So where are we in terms of the number that you perceive may need to be challenged again or locked at again? I, I wouldn't have that information. It would, I'd have to speak to the departmental solicitor. Um, the legislation that I would be bringing forward is predominantly on, uh, on, on rail and rail-related issues. Um, this is the only one. So far. This is the, the, the only one that, that we have that, uh, that there has been an issue with in terms of EU exit. So you can guarantee the committee, as far from your position, this is the only one we have? From my position and the legal advice that I have, this is the only one that there is an issue with. But we were given previous legal advice that things were OK. And that was the legal advice that we had at the time. And that's what I'm saying to you, Graham. So, so as of quarter to ten this morning, you're saying to me you're aware of just this one at the minute. So there may be a possibility that something will come up next week again. So I'm asking that in respect of this committee and our role and responsibility and scrutiny role and making sure that the decisions we make as a committee jointly, we are getting it right because we now may need to seek legal advice ourselves on the SRs chair, to be honest with you. I don't know. But that's all I'm saying. I mean, you can see what position we as a committee are now in in relation to agreeing uh, SRs in the future, Chair. Sure. Let's be honest. That's what I appreciate your answer. But you know where we're coming from. You know where we're coming from in terms of yeah. a committee member. Okay, and just for clarity, could you give uh, outline the consequences of us not agreeing to this? Uh, there will be an error in EU law, and uh, this issue will have to come back because it's uh, my understanding. The legal advice that I have at the moment is that it needs to be revoked, so that we uh, our domestic statute is compatible with the Northern Ireland Protocol. Okay. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. And I would echo some of the words of um, previous speakers in relation to concerns around us. We receive information from the Department in good faith and the advice that is given, and then take our decisions on the basis of that. So it is concerning that it has been contrary to that. Um, we're, the transition period comes to an end very, very shortly. It is not very long left. So we are left with a very difficult situation here where we want to ensure that we abide with the terms of EU exit. And, People can have a discussion about the different merits of the protocol, but that it's law, mm. and we need to implement that, and we need to ensure we give guidance to different transport operators. In relation to this, we declare there was previously an employee of TransLink. Um, I think also the difficulty is, is that we only have one more committee meeting, which is next week, to be able to give uh, to resolve this issue. But this issue needs resolved. We can't have a situation where we're not compliant with law. You know, this is the outwork of Brexit, and people will have a discussion about that in another time. But we need to ensure that we are actually complying with the law. And we need to get insurance, assurance, as has been said, that the previous stuff that we have been considered has actually been right and proper. Because that, that causes me great concern that information has been proffered to the committee might have been incorrect. Okay, Ms. Kelly. Uh, Chair, the, the, the problem seems to be contrary to legal advice. You know, that legal advice received one week that said one thing. I mean, never mind the whole Brexit, which is really where yeah. it all stems from. But they, they, they surely then the committee, um, in terms of the department's legal solicitors, is something maybe the committee might want to pick up directly with the legal um, office, if you like, the office of, uh, you know, to say that we've received this, the department has received this contra contradictory advice, which has put us all in a bit of a bind at short notice. I, I don't think we have much option other than to take the legal advice that's before us and to move things on. But nonetheless. If, if there's a, a problem within the within the legal advice unit, that's something that we should be raising through officials to, uh, uh, and ask for how this came about and, and what was the particular expertise from whom uh, the legal advice was sought. Was it the appropriate personnel? Graham, can I ask if uh, a delay of a week on this would make any difference to you, just in order <coughs> to give the committee some comfort? Uh, no, um, there is uh, so there is issues around the, the, the meeting the twenty one day rule, but um, I think I, I think it would be appropriate to um, if we can put that to the side that uh, I come back and address these questions, particularly with in relation to uh, the contradictory legal advice. Well, I think to give members some comfort that might be useful, but I'll obviously take the, 
the, the mind of everyone here before we decide that. Mr Beggs and then Ms Anderson. I'm surprised we're talking here and we haven't talked about the statutory rule which you said was presented in October which no longer meets the legal requirement. Can we have a reference to what it is? Because we're all talking in the it's, dark. Uh, it's our, um, I think, it's either 276 or 277. It's uh, the, the regulation uh, EC 1370 2007 Public Service Obligations and Transport um, Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2020. We've got a specific title. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Anderson. That sounds to me like the regulation you sent back, Chair. I'm sorry? That sounds to me like the regulation that you sent back to double check because we questioned that in this committee if it was compatible. There was a particular regulation. There was two elements of it, uh, uh, and we sent back. There was like a three and six, and you can remember I only actually spoke about one of them when we were referring to both of them. Um, but I'm asking, Chair, is there um, a role for the examiner statutory rules for us to come in front of us um, next week uh, in session as well? Because whilst we've had conflicting legal advice, just to satisfy ourselves that all of the statutory rules that we have passed on the advice that we had from the departmental legal advice at that time um, sent us on a particular trajectory, despite our questioning of it. So that might, that might help us. But um, I concur with the view that this is law. Whatever about one's view of us, it is the law. And uh, domestic statute needs to be compatible with the protocol, regardless of what you think about it. Look, if, if members are content that we might pause it and we will, um, Graham can come back with further information and we can seek um, some advice with regards to this for a discussion then um, at the start of next week's meeting, if you're content with that. Okay? Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Graham. Thanks very much, Graham. Okay. Moving then to item 7, SR 202292, the Planning General Permitted Development Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, at page 247. The committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 4th of November 2020 and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SR1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with the rule? That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 202292, the Planning General Permitted Development Amendment Order in Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Item 8, SR 202299, the Motor Vehicles Driving Licences Amendment No. 2, Coronavirus Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, at page 271. The committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 2nd of December and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. The department has pointed out that it has not complied with the 21-day rule in setting an operational date of the 7th of December 2020, and it apologises for this breach. However, while regrettable, the department believes that the breach was unavoidable as urgent action was required, as described above, to further address this issue, which has arisen because of the ongoing coronavirus public health emergency. Ms Anderson. Uh, Chair, I've been getting emails up until yesterday um, from constituents who have been asking about the extension of the theory test uh, certificates. So can we ask when this is going to kick in, or did you actually say the 7th of December? The 7th of December. It has actually kicked yes. in? Okay. So it is in effect as of today. Are members yeah. content? Great. Okay. So the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2022-99, the Motor Vehicles Driving Licences Amendment No. 2, Coronavirus Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules, has no objection to the rule. Great. Okay. Thank you. Moving then to our first briefing. Um, it's at item, as item 9, which is a briefing from the Northern Ireland Taxi Operators Financial Assistance for Taxi Operators. Um, that's at page 281, and we have a letter from the Northern Ireland Taxi Operators requesting to, to brief uh, the committee. Ansard will record the meeting, and we have in attendance um, Stephen Anton, the Communications Manager for Phonacab, Christopher McCausland, Managing Director of Value Cabs, 
Eamon Corrigan, the depot owner of Regency Taxis, Eamon O'Donnell, manager of North West Taxi Riders, and we have Cathy Malley, um, depot owner of Clan Ride Taxis, and she is presenting via Starleaf. So you're all very welcome to committee this morning. Um, Stephen, I understand that you're going to make an opening <coughs> statement, and then we'll do a quick run round everyone else just for a, a minute or so for you to add anything additional that you feel that may be um, pertinent to this morning's discussion. So I'll leave it to you, Stephen. Thank you very much. Um, I have a, a short oral presentation which I hope informs our position as, uh, as described. Um, uh, so if you'll indulge me, I'll just rattle through it. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, thank you for this opportunity to present today. Uh, we appreciate the pressures on your time and the difficult issues you are dealing with. Uh, while I am part of the management team at Phonacab, I am presenting today on behalf of a growing number of more than 40 taxi operators responsible for a majority of drivers across Northern Ireland. Uh, while we do not claim to represent the entire taxi sector, we are representative of the operators in the sector. Um, my colleagues, who thank, thank you for introducing them, who are here today, uh, are from uh, across Northern Ireland, uh, Derry, Belfast, Antrim and Newry. Uh, but we have gathered opinion and uh, examples from operators in your constituencies across the country. Uh, just to add as well, we are grateful for the fact that you have indulged four of us here today and one on Starleaf. But because of the geographic spread of the operators, uh, we thought if you needed to ask questions, we wanted to be able to answer them. So thank you. Um, we were invited by the Department to be part of the discussions around the implementation of financial support schemes for the sector, and we thank the Committee and the Department for supporting taxi drivers, but they are only one half of the sector. Uh, today we are asking for your help in encouraging the Department to introduce a financial support package for taxi operators. For your information, operators in the private hire sector may be different sizes and have slightly different business models, but ultimately we all work in the same way. We all provide a range of services to enable self-employed drivers to carry out their business and charge the driver a depot rent for doing so. Uh, these services include managing bookings, dispatch, accounts and payments, driver admin, lost property, customer services and functions such as IT and telephony. We also support the work of the DFI by keeping drivers who are older or less computer literate uh, in keeping their licence obligations correct and up to date. In Phonacab's case, pre-coronavirus, this all required around 100 permanent employees. Uh, many of these functions are legal requirements under the terms of our taxi licences, our taxi operators' licences. Uh, we have one, whether we have one or 100,000 customers a week, we still must resource these positions and cannot furlough the staff. At the start of the pandemic in March, when many businesses closed, taxi operators stayed open to continue to support the communities we serve. Uh, when bookings vanished with the introduction of lockdown, we stopped charging drivers to enable them to continue to work, and indeed free or discounted rents are still in place today. In the absence of official guidance, operators took the lead on driver and passenger safety. Uh, when requirements came in for home working and adapting offices to make them COVID compliant, we complied. And as I hope you can appreciate, with taxi companies running many depots across 24 hours, seven days a week, the cost was comparatively higher than many other sectors. Before COVID, the taxi industry was already suffering from a decline in driver numbers and an already older and ageing driver population. Uh, when COVID hit, many of these drivers chose to self-isolate and not work, while others initially continued before stopping due to low earning potential despite operators subsidising their depot costs. A significant number of these drivers will never return to taxiing, with many taking more stable job options or retiring from the industry altogether. This is a problem now and will only get worse with concerns all being raised about our ability to continue to serve our communities and sustain the industry into the future without financial help. With the reduced number of drivers working and with the cost of subsidising those who do, operators have had to cut staff, we believe on average by over 30 per cent. Some operators can no longer operate 24-7, denying their, in many cases, socially disadvantaged communities the access to services in society that are not met by other forms of transport. It is not the affluent who want to travel that suffer, it is those that must travel and have no alternative. The elderly, the trip to the hospital, those away from a bus or train route, the night shift or the essential worker in the small hours. Uh, as an example, last week at this committee you heard from Belfast International Airport, who as part of their presentation talked about the 5,000 medical flights they handle every year and the over 6 million passenger journeys undertaken from the airport by EasyJet. 
To illustrate the value that the taxi sector brings to our communities, I would like to offer some figures of our own. <coughs> Uh, in 2019, Phonacab completed more than 5,000 journeys, taking customers to the renal unit at City Hospital for dialysis, and we transported, we transported blood supplies between hospitals and specifically equipped vehicles more than 4,000 times. These are just a couple of examples from one business that was on target to get 14 million passengers to work, school, shops, hospitals, and many more destinations, <coughs> destinations in the year. But every operator, regardless of size, can tell a similar story of the irreplaceable value we bring to our communities across the country. Whether it's equipping cars to safely bring the public for COVID testing, over 60 cars carrying throw ropes in case of river emergencies, and others carry, carrying defibrillators to help the emergency services in the northwest. <coughs> Pardon me. Operators organising hot meals to be delivered to the community whenever no other option was available. Working with the housing executive and the NSPCC to help vulnerable adults and children, these are all times when taxi operators have stepped up with their drivers. It has even been reported in the news just this week that when the PSNI broke up an illegal party, it was the taxi companies that they called to get the offenders home. If the sector is to sustain this support into the future, we need help. With the recent increase in lockdown restrictions, even fewer drivers are working. And while the limited opportunity to work in the next two weeks leading up to Christmas may encourage some to return temporarily, it is of little comfort before the longer quieter months ahead, and this is only made worse with the prospect of more lockdowns in the new year. <clears throat> we are not by any means out of the woods yet. Some smaller depots have already closed. Others have admitted they will not make it through the next quarter. The bigger operators may have greater resources, but these come with equally large running costs, which must be met. We are confident we can demonstrate exceptional circumstances and meet similar eligibility criteria to that which was published in the recently announced DFI Coach Operators Grant Scheme. This is a sector which has many similarities with our own and a scheme which demonstrates precedence by the Department in offering same. Some of these are detailed in our submission to this committee and include our licence obligations and our considerable demonstrable financial loss. Additionally, we also believe that taxi operators are the only businesses that have subsidised others to continue to work while suffering all the associated losses. If our efforts, to support, if our efforts for support are unsuccessful, well, what happens next? Well, as we already said, some depots have closed already, others are close to closing, and some have delayed further redundancies in the hope that things will improve. There is very little positivity in this sector for the future. Services will be curtailed sponsorship in local communities cut, charitable activity culled, fewer taxis to welcome tourists when the market returns, more pressure on our health service to provide secondary services, who provides transport for wheelchair users and passengers with sight difficulties and guide dogs, who services rural areas uh, that other transport operators cannot. One commentator on social media even went as far as to suggest an increase in drink driving when there is no one to get you home after the pub. The operators have worked closely with this committee and the department over the years, and we believe that the good work that you have done in regulating the industry through the Taxi Act, mostly in making it self-regulating by empowering the operators, is under threat. If you excuse the pun, you have been on this journey with us, and we hope that you will know the value. Not supporting the operators will lead to a rise in unregulated taxis and the many associated issues which we hoped had been left in the past. Uh, they will not contribute and invest in our communities, and it may ultimately mean that when we have a return to normality in society, there may not be a taxi sector to return to. When we were told that taxi operators were being excluded from grant support, we questioned the rationale behind this decision, especially considering the support offered by the Department to the similar coach sector, and we provided evidence to demonstrate why the direction that the Department had taken was misguided. Uh, when in a follow-up meeting we met with department officials, the response, that is a political decision, was most common in their answers. Uh, we hope to have illustrated the issues and concerns that our operators are experiencing to you, our politicians, and respectfully ask for your support in addressing these through the implementation of a meaningful financial support scheme for the operators. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Eamon, would you like to say anything at this stage? I, I would like to actually read off the executive's website, if you don't mind. Uh, First Minister Arlene Foster, who, as we know, Cahill, used to be the minister when we were doing all this stuff, getting the reg regulations going. Arlene Foster said that COVID-19 has enormously has had an enormously damaging impact on all sectors of business and services. The operators of taxis, private buses, 
and coaches have faced a significant reduction in the demand for their services, yet their overheads have continued. It is absolutely right that they should be able to avail of financial assistance to sustain them through this difficult time, and I hope they will take some comfort in knowing that support will be forthcoming. That was Arlene Vosser. Uh, Michelle O'Neill, on the same page, has said that the Executive is committed to providing all possible support to business and workers affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. The taxi, private bus and coach sectors have been negatively impacted through loss of earnings, and many have shouldered the cost of implementing safety measures to ensure the safety of their customers. I am pleased that the executive support schemes will soon include a bespoke funding package to alleviate the hardship being faced by workers in these sectors. So what the First and Deputy First Minister did was, and that's the last paragraph, the First and Deputy First Minister have written to the Infrastructure Minister, setting out the determination and designation under the Financial Assistance Northern Ireland Act 2009, which enables the Department for Infrastructure to take forward a scheme to provide assistance. They have also requested that the Infrastructure Minister provides further details in relation to their consideration of the impacts of a pandemic on the road haulage sector. So basically, we have engaged with the department. We, we did it in good faith. We did highlight in them engagements the desperation of taxi drivers because of the poverty issues for taxi drivers were out there. But we also highlighted, and to be fair, I would say to the actual operators, they put taxi drivers a wee bit ahead of them because they were the, the, of the poverty and some of the stories that were there. But the taxi operators were crystal clear. They need support. Businesses, small businesses, especially the local, some of the smaller ones. Up in Derry, we have, we have one company has closed during the pandemic. We have had to get the drivers under, under all our operator licences, which is hard to do, considering cold rain emptied on March 18th. Uh, and, and we had to do phone calls and work with people at home. <coughs> but there are other operators out there. As Michelle O'Neill says, they, they, they have used and, and, and their, their own resources, and, and Stephen ha, has said that they have used their own resources to, t- to keep the operation rolling in the absence of, of, of support being there. The coffers are empty. The small operators, some of them, not some of them, but most of them that I have spoken to, are in the red. They are running at a loss. Most taxi companies are running at a loss. We have <coughs> lost one so far. We have lost a taxi driver who, when taxi drivers are on the front line, one of them locally in Derry has died, Seamus Locri. And basically, what we're saying is we're being asked to go out on, on the front lines. The, the taxi operators are managing the things, they've managed all sorts of supports within their communities. And all of this is done through the, the, the operators. The operator license, which was set up, you've been part of a Cahill rolling forward for too long is set up as, as, as a self-tier, a self-regulatory tier within the local communities. That whole network and setup that has come through 20 years of work, working with you in the committee and, and, the, and the departments, that all stands to go to the wall once we lost the operators, and especially the small operators. Once they're gone, they're gone. And some of these people have their houses hanging on this. So our request is based on, on the First Minister saying support will be forthcoming. It's based on the, the Deputy First Minister saying we understand that you've used your own money and people actually have, have went too far now and there's going to be job losses, there's going to be taxi companies going to the wall and there's going to be a massive loss to local communities for the service that we supply. Thank you. Christopher? Yep, thank you for letting me jump. The situation just with their own company giving you a bit of background as to what we have done um, at the moment. I mean, we do believe that the taxi industry is one industry made up of both drivers and operators, and we think that they both work very well together in making sure that the industry survives. Um, we, as a company, put a letter into the department on the 16th of October um, in, in reference to the scheme, which was introduced by the department, just saying that we felt that the scheme must support both sides of the industry. You can't really split the industry in two. You know, so we're very much in support of the driver scheme, but we also felt that the operator scheme should have come at the same time. Um, during the time of the pandemic, um, us ourselves as a company um, have had rent reductions um, to our drivers of around 1.2 million, um, which we have provided obviously to support the drivers. We started off with no rent, no depot rents at all when the scheme came out. 
We had about 780 taxis on our license when it started, and we went back to about 150 drivers working within a very short period of time. Um, those numbers did build up again when the economy opened um, in the middle of August, and there was quite a few tourists in the city again, and we probably got our drivers back to about 450. And we're currently now running below 300 again with the, the latest lockdowns and stuff. Um, I think important factors for the taxi operators is that we employ a lot of people within our depots. Um, Value Cabs itself um, had 85 staff um, on our books and our call centre, accounts, marketing, IT, sales, driver management, and looking after the operator licensing management. Um, at the start of the pandemic, we are now down to 55 staff. So we have had to let go about 35% of our workforce at the moment through um, payoffs and redundancies. Um, generally, employment, these are people who obviously had worked for our company for a long period of time, and there was not one of those people that we would want to let go. You know, it was just a need that we had to do it to bring the cost down. Um, from our original driver numbers, as I said, we dropped to 150, and we're now running about 300. Um, I think at the... Uh, introduction of the coach operators scheme is obviously very important to the whole thing as well. You know, coach op operators have look, have been looked at by the department. They've been said they've had financial losses and they've been supported. And for some reason, they've decided not to support taxi operators. And we are a very important part of the uh, ongoing um, vital services in our own company during the COVID period. We have done. Um, 35,300 jobs for the, the hospital trusts during the period. We have picked up members of the public from hospital sites, 17,500 people. We have supported the Northern Ireland Housing Executive Homeless, um, and we have done around 1,240 jobs for that. We hold the Belfast City Airport contract, so we have supplied taxis, have had to be there for obviously the arriving flights from the UK to obviously encourage connectivity between the two parts. Um, we have contracts with TransLink Central Station for the like of all the Dublin trains, um, and obviously our contracts with all hotels, restaurants, and all that. We must provide the service. We're contracted to these people to do these services, and therefore we've had to remain open at a very large financial loss to ourselves. Okay, thank you, Eamon. Uh, yes. Uh, <coughs> good morning, folks. Uh, I'd just like to state that we, uh, day one. We were led to believe by the department that we were working with the department. I have a letter here, it's the same generic letter that would be sent out to coach operators, taxi drivers, and taxi operators. And it keeps us all within the one industry. And the heading on this letter from the department is assessment of financial support needed for the taxi industry due to COVID 19. Now, during the presentation, you people received yourselves from the department. The department led you to believe on the 4th of November that taxi operators were happy that as long as taxi drivers got that support in their grant scheme, that we were content with that um, from a point of view, as was stated, with they called it direct in intervention. That's not the case. Um, tax, no taxi operator made that point to the department. The other thing from this letter you can see, the department made it clear that they were not supporting taxi operators because we had a veil of other grants. And it states in this letter here that taxi operators availed of a £25,000 retail hospitality tourism grant and taxi depots were listed on that. I can categorically tell you that's not the case. We do not avail of that. No, no operator availed of that anywhere across the province. Thank you. Um, can I call Cathy? You can hear us. <coughs> You're muted there, Cathy. Um, I'd like to say on a personal level from Leary, we have been um, inundated from the very start whenever COVID came in. The number of drivers in our own firm, in other firms, that all come to us for advice to try to help them, to try to get um, the grants. Unfortunately, an awful lot of them were impatient and left um, and sort of went maybe for universal credit, went to other jobs, 
haven't come back into the industry. We have been so stressed and had to stay open to try to help them and to try to help ourselves throughout all of this. And that's not just in Newry, it's Warren Point, Hilltown, Newcastle, all Castlewell and Camla. There are a couple of companies in Camelot who've actually had to close. There are also a company in Warren Point that had to close. And actually what he's doing now is doing freelance and um, trying to help other companies because he, he they just can't afford to take them on. So they're just doing so, uh, a few jobs here there for them. And um, basically, I can explain the same as all the rest with regard to a drop in our wages, a drop in the drivers. I, I don't need to go over all that. But what I'm saying is, at the minute, there doesn't seem to be a light at the end of the tunnel for us. We have uh, suffered financially throughout all of this and tried our best to keep it going because it's what we know, it's what we're good at, and it's what we do best. Um, at the minute, the problem is that an awful lot of us and the guys there feel that we need help to be able to sustain this, to be able to keep this going and to be able to get at the other end of Christmas, March, April time, that we can try our best to get this business all back up and running again at the best. to probably similar to where it was this time last year. Running at half cost at the minute, or full cost, but half the revenue that's coming in. It's really difficult, even down to one of the local restaurants um, put in an advert to say that we'll be open at the weekend, but you must ring your taxis really early because they are really understaffed. And we need you out for 11. So even from the perspective of trying to make sure that the regulations are right and proper for COVID going forward, we don't have enough drivers. They're aware that we don't have enough drivers. So there's the implications of all of this is catastrophic over the next couple of weeks from what I can see. Um, basically, we, like the other guys there, we're continuing to help the NHS staff, their patients, vulnerable adults, school runs, um, with even down to you know, the pharmacy and uh, doing a few of their runs for them. We don't want to close. We don't. And the drivers, this is what they know best. And this is what they know. That's the only thing they know. There's so many drivers out there where all they were making was their minimum. They weren't even making the minimum wage while COVID was here. So we're trying to help them through that. And we're suffering from that. And we just want a wee bit of help to be able to keep this business going and to be able to say, look at what we know best. There's not A lot of these drivers are all over the ages of 50. They're not computer literate with the way things all are. They, they don't know what else to do. So the problem that we have at the minute is there's so many drivers out there that they can't go and get another job stacking shelves in Tesco's or Sainsbury's. That's just not, and they don't know how to learn something else. So we really need to help the businesses to be able to support these drivers as well and try to get it all back to where we originally was. So it's quite frightening times ahead of us. And I think we need all the help we can get at the minute. Thank you, Cathy, and thank you um, to all of you for presenting this morning. Um, in a, a response to a priority question which I put to the Minister, I got the response back early this morning. It really isn't very dissimilar to what Eamon read out from the letter that he had received. Um, and basically, the response would be that um, because drivers didn't have premises, they couldn't qualify for other support that other businesses could. They go on to say, however, taxi businesses operators did have premises, could have availed of one or other of the business support grants or loan schemes available. For those reasons, um, the um, I put in place um, the scheme I put in place is designed to assist drive taxi drivers who could not avail of the existing schemes but still incurred overhead costs from March until September of this year. Taxi operators advised that providing financial support to drivers would also provide indirect support to them by helping taxi drivers remain in business. Now, you would obviously um, have a, an issue with regards to the content of that response. If I may answer that one, I think that is a, a misunderstanding of something that Phonacab said as part of our submission. Uh, what we said in our submission, uh, sorry, as part, by our submission, what I mean is that the department actually asked each of our operators involved in the group to come back with how has the pandemic affected you, what costs have you incurred, and we put some forward some suggestions as to how we thought uh, the department could implement the scheme. So one of the things that we said in that was that we welcomed any support that we would get as operators. We also said that um, we thought that the best benefit <coughs> the drivers would have would be the reopening of the economy so that drivers could go out and continue to earn and work so that they could contribute to their depot costs themselves. We then made a suggestion, which was that, and it was actually done on the benefit of trying to benefit, uh, done on the basis of trying to benefit everyone involved, and that was 
Uh, an example might be to uh, grant aid the drivers by uh, supporting their depot rent through the operators. Uh, that had the benefit of um, making the administration and the auditing easier for the department because they would be dealing with fewer operators rather than a mass number of uh, drivers. It would make the situation better for um, operators because that cash flow would be travelling through our business. The depot rents which we were subsidising would be subsidised through a grant scheme. And it would have the biggest benefit for the drivers because what it would mean would be that A, they would have all of their costs covered as far as allowing them to work. Uh, but on top of that, um, a lot of drivers we've already heard today are not computer literate. They didn't get to hear about the scheme, and from what I understand, uh, no more than about 60% of drivers have applied for the scheme. If the scheme had been put through operators, uh, we could have made sure that every driver was aware of this, every driver got an application in, and every driver had the same opportunity. Now, the economy has not reopened. In fact, if anything, since that statement was made, uh, the situation has got worse with the recent lockdown. And I'm reading in the news this morning that even with the opening or the lifting of the lockdown this week, many of the pubs around Belfast, the bigger ones like the Limelight and the Pavilion and Laveries, have chosen not to open before Christmas. And that is going to cause a lot of drivers to say, well, what's the point in coming out? So the economy has not opened. The uh, suggestion of filtering uh, driver aid through the depots, which would have helped all of us, that did not happen. So the suggestion that funding the drivers would indeed help us has been taken out of context because every other aspect of our submission has either not happened or has been ignored. Okay. Um, you've obviously met with the Minister and with departmental officials now on a number of occasions. At what point were you made aware that you wouldn't ha receive any support? And obviously since the announcement of the support package um, and subsequent discussions that you've had with officials, what indication have you been given um, from them that something may um, be put in place to, to help you? Um. Well, the last meeting we had with the Minister was whenever the Minister was advising. Uh, sorry, uh, perhaps if I take you back one step on that. Uh, all of us as part of this group, we have been working with the Department over the years, but specifically on coronavirus since March. Uh, we have asked the Department on everything from guidance on screens, PPE, how many people can get into a taxi, should we continue to operate. Uh, we have asked so many questions, and in many cases we have had to take the decisions ourselves. So whenever we asked the question about financial support for the sector, uh, what the department did was the department uh, drew together us as operators and then the representatives from uh, the driver groups who had also been asking specifically support for support on behalf of the drivers. And they handled this as all as one group, all as one sector. Uh, we went forward on the basis that we were trying to get support for the sector uh, as a whole. And then at the last meeting, which was in, uh, at the end of October, we were told that, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we're going to be supporting the drivers, but we're excluding the operators. Now, since then, the drivers have uh, chosen uh, to uh, engage directly with the department and have not wanted us to be involved. And that, that's their prerogative. We would still welcome any benefits that the drivers get. Uh, but we have had to have engaged with the department as operators separately now. Uh, we did request a meeting uh, with the department, and uh, uh, we met with a number of the senior officials from the DFI who, um, I'll be honest, we were disappointed with the response that we got. And as I say, the, the, the line, uh, that would be a political decision, came out more often than not. And uh, uh, it was very much left for us to go back and try and get political support if we were to make any success in moving this forwards. And that's the position we find ourselves in. And obviously the key to this is about exceptional circumstances. And if the department are, are stating that you have been able to access other assistance, obviously then that is seen then as an exemption, um, particularly in relation to premises. And I know that some of you will have multiple premises, um, so but you will only have received then perhaps one grant for the business as opposed to for each of the premises. Um, could you maybe just expand on that with regards to the issue around exceptional circumstances and how um, uh, the, the other assistance obviously excludes you from that? Uh, 
the schemes which came out were not schemes which were designed for the taxi sector. They were schemes which were designed for business. Um, speaking on behalf of Phonacab, um, we were able to avail of one rates grant of £10,000 for the business. Uh, we didn't get any hospitality grant. We did avail of furlough, but under the terms of a taxi operator licence, you have to still continue to operate and provide services such as lost property, customer services, driver management, complaints. You have to be able to track your vehicles, you have to be able to track your drivers, you have to be able to audit what's going on in your business. None of these functions could be furloughed. All of these functions still had to be funded. Even if we had one customer, we still had to pay that every single week. So there, there was the obligation under exceptional circumstances for complying with our licences. Uh, other uh, benefits that were, uh, I suppose, discussed were VAT deferral and rates deferral. They were deferrals. Uh, since they were deferred, they have since been paid in, in most cases. Uh, and the other thing that many of us have, have had to do is take uh, a business loan. And a loan is just that. Uh, while it has given a much needed cash injection into the business, it must be paid back, and that will impact upon every operator's cash flow over the next number of years. Now, what made this even more disappointing was whenever we were told that those were the reasons or some of the reasons why we couldn't avail of grant funding, it came as a huge shock to find that furlough and grants and uh, business support loans were all eligible under the coach operator scheme. Uh, they were considered as income and provided that you could demonstrate a net loss to your income, even taking all these things into account, you were eligible. So we questioned the discrimination between the coach operators and the taxi operators. Why were we being told one thing whenever the operators in the coach sector were being told something else? Can I ask one final question? Whenever you are, you're saying that you are asking for meaningful support, what does that mean? Um, we are all operators of different sizes. Um, Phonacab would be the biggest. Uh, before the pandemic, we would have had 100 staff and 1,400 drivers. We probably have around about 60 staff after two rounds of redundancy and around about 850 active drivers. But a big company requires big financial resources to keep it going and provide the services. Uh, in terms of specifics, in terms of pound notes, I don't think I would like to put a figure on that because uh, as we're, I'm talking about Phonacab, but we're representing the industry and anything which may well be suitable for us may well uh, unfairly push down the amount that a smaller operator may be entitled to. So what we think needs to be just and fair for the industry is that the smaller operators uh, get a, let's just say, a good starting point, uh, a meaningful amount to let them uh, support their businesses. And we realise that as large, larger operators, we may well fall, fall foul of European funding caps. But um, we don't think that that should be a reason to either penalise us at the top end or penalise the smaller operators at the bottom end. Thank you. Christopher, had you indicated? Well, it was just similar to what Stephen was saying there. The scheme that we have sort of looked at and discussed ourselves would be loaded, obviously, with similar to the coach operator scheme, which has an amount for the first bus and then an amount for each one thereafter. And our sort of thoughts were that it would be based on the number of drivers that were on the licences at the start of the pandemic with a large amount for the first driver and then a smaller amount for the drivers thereafter so that the smaller operators got a good benefit from the scheme as well rather than the, the larger operators. And again, as Stephen says, this, there would be a, obviously a ceiling to it all. You know, so we, we are here to talk for all the operators in Northern Ireland, um, whether they're large or small, and we think everybody should benefit from it. Thank you. Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and you're you all welcome back. And Eamon, <laughs> after all these years, Christopher, I think, was there at the start too. And Cathy, we haven't forgotten you over there in Yuri as well. Um, you're very welcome. Yes, no, I just want to tease out some things. Obviously, we understand the whole in industry has been impacted and, and the whole of society, but I, I just want to get round to the, the point of exactly how we can assist you. Because it's up to this committee here to give everybody a voice and, and assist where we can. Say in terms of um, the coach operators, because you're talking about a support package, is, is it different to it? Is it on hardship grounds, or what? What way are you trying to, or what are you asking us in terms? I of think it, I think it's package? similar to the coach operators. I mean, at the end of the day, we both operate a similar type of transport business. Um, some of us have. I mean, there's a big range of different companies in the taxi operators. Some have their own fleet. Some have owner drivers, some have every, you know, all different sort of mechanisms of doing it. But we all operate services within the industry. 
Um, and some of the, I mean, I think the way the scheme was set up for the coach drivers is probably a good way to do it, where you have so much for the first one and then so much for each one thereafter. Um, it covered them for losses. It covered them for, you know, their overheads as, you know, as well that had to keep going on. They have certain things in their license that they had to do. We have things in our license that we have to do. And obviously we've had the expenses of running those things um, right through the pandemic. I think that's the important part. And I think the, the two things should not have been separated and neither should the two ends of the taxi um, industry. You know, there are drivers in the industry and there are operators in the industry and the industry won't work without the two, the two, the two sections. See, 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 just to come back, Cal, on some of that. I mean, a lot of the structure within the industry came from the, the executive or from, from the Department of the Environment and the, the Environment Committee and the issues that we thrashed out whereby the structure was the self-regulation through the operators and all of that. So all of this was done. People have felt the pain for the years, taking on the training, taking on all the different aspects, and, and, and it did move the taxi industry forward. Now, in terms of what, what does it mean? It means hardship. It means frustration. It means desperation. It means a whole lot of things. Now, as, as Stephen <coughs> says, some of the bigger operators may be able to be able to take a, a bit more pain than the smaller ones. And the like a areas like Straban and Derry, smaller operators, have bought in to the whole, the whole concept of, of taking the taxi industry and bringing it in to the 21st century and, and, and really moving forward. We have invested heavily in book and dispatch systems for a small operation in the like Straban. They invest, it's about 40,000, and that covers the, 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 the Straban area, bringing it up, 24-7 services and all of that. That guy up in Straban now has taken out his book and dispatch system. He's back on radios. He's back the way we were 15, 20 years ago. Uh, is that hardship? It's hardship. It's also the operator licensing stuff, all the regulation that, that's easily covered in a computerised system now has to go on the paperwork. Uh, as well as that, for the smaller operator, hardship is, is that I could lose my business. I could lose my home. You know, all, all the issues that come with that there. So there is hardship. Uh, there is loss of income. When the pandemic hit, it was a cliff age. It, you know it was a cliff age for everybody, but for, for the taxi industry, it was just a cliff age down. We made a gradual comeback, and then it went off, off the edge again. They can't charge depot no, rents no, and stuff like that. So all the stuff that, that has been covered, without going over all of that. No, no, I appreciate that. And in the Austin, that context, I mean, the, in Haverly or South Cathy, I mean, out there, in, out in the good area in Uri and Armagh, to be fair. Um, <laughs> As long as the point, the real question is, you're looking at a carbon copy of the coach. Yeah, similar, uh, similar scheme. Similar scheme to what the coach operators benefited from, yes. Yeah. And in terms of just sort of two quick points, because no other members want to come in. Obviously, the, vaccine, the vaccination programme is going to be rolled out now. You've said there, in terms of recruitment and the loss of, you know, that's a big hit on the industry. How, how can we help you or assist in terms of that? And I'll tie in the other issue too as well, because there's issues here over the new theory test and supports for it. Can the department do any more for the for the just two questions I want to ask right around them? Okay. If I can say yeah. something first. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, we, we, we would value the committee's support in terms of looking at all aspects of driver licensing, driver training, the costs involved in getting drivers into the industry, keeping drivers in the industry. Anything that we can get there will be of benefit to try and keep these guys on the road, but also then to try and encourage more drivers back into the I suppose one of the things that we're conscious of uh, is that even with the lockdowns, drivers still have to complete their CPC. They mm. still have to worry about P PSVs. Uh, after Christmas, they're going to have to worry, a lot of them, about finding the money for their insurance, their annual tax return, all these things. Uh, so uh, it, it would it, support in terms of the administration of being a taxi driver would absolutely be welcomed. However, w one thing I would say is I suppose at this stage we don't want to muddy the waters because if we don't get the direct financial support that we're asking for, I don't think we're going to be, or many of us will be around to be doing these things with our drivers. No, no, I appreciate it. I'm just taking because I'm mindful of what Cathy said about some of the drivers she knows, and there's no other option for them, and whether they go and stack shelves in Tesco's. I mean, certainly the support package is the key element. What you're saying to the committee today, yeah. but there's other issues we can throw in because so. there's going to be a recovery program from it. And he asked in that context, I mean, Cathy, you want to say anything before anybody else? Well, the only thing I will say, Cahill, is that with regard to um, anybody coming into the industry, it's it, I think we've had three drivers this year, and that's it. 
the rest of them and any a lot of the older men as you know coming in out of Newry there's a lot of older men in the industry my father and another guy over 70 I've had to pull the two of them back into work again to try to help out on Saturdays and Sundays and weekends because there's a lot of them who are just not going to go through that CPC they're just not they're not a computer literate to be able to go onto the computer and try this theory test try it, it, a lot of our Drivers are all in their 50s. They don't particularly uh, want to go in and do the theory test. They did that maybe in their 20s, but not now. It's so much more difficult to get into the industry. Our part-time staff is down to zero, not only from COVID, but just from the implications of the changes a couple of years ago. So the industry is on a slump at the minute without COVID. And I think we really need to get things back on track again and start trying to get people into the industry and help them as best we can. Thank you. Eamon, my hair was jet black when I started the taxi. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a final comment from yourself. Just, just as Stephen says, we don't want the money the waters. We're here for a support package to get us through where we are. In the event that we're talking recovery package as well, then we're happy to look at, at, at how we recover fr from it. But the, 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 as, as has been mentioned, the actual suspension, we have suspended the, the, the vehicle test, we've suspended the, and, and extend it, the, the, the tax, all them uh, exemptions were all brilliant. It would be, we have lost, I would say, easily 30% of the taxi industry, given the age and the age profile and all of that there. So if we already bounce back and if the vaccine does what, it's, what, what it should do and we already bounce back, then we, we, we have a lot of other guys to replace and, and it would be... Are, uh, now we're the people that, that went through all of this and put everything, and we're happy happy they, they, they go along with the stuff that you've put on in the past. But we, we would ask for an, a further exemption, and that exemption would be the suspension of the entry procedures uh, for taxi people coming on. They make up the 30 per cent that we've lost. They make it up quickly so that we can support the hospitals, support the the, the, all the different statutory services, they supply the nighttime economy, they supply the daytime economy, they do all they do. If we're going to bounce back in line, then we're going to need further further help from me. But to bring it back to why we're here today, yeah. why we're here today is about a support package because if we don't get the support package, there won't be an industry to come back to, especially the smaller operators that are out there. No, fair enough. I just want to raise those points. Okay. okay thank Thanks, you. Chair. Mr Muir? Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for coming today. Um, I think throughout all this, we've just started to understand the, the term excluded and people who have haven't received support, and you should probably fall into that category. And from my perspective, it is important that you get that support, not just so you can see yourself through the pandemic, but on the other side of that, in terms of the recovery, uh, that you are going to be particularly important. And the particular concerns around the nighttime economy um, and the concerns around drink driving and stuff like that. You know, if people are going to want in bars and pubs to be opening again next summer, hopefully, if the vaccine works out, then you are a key part of that in terms of getting people home safely. And you've given an estimate around the percentage of drivers you think you've lost of about 30 per cent, if you feel that would be an accurate. There is about 30 per cent across the board. When we ask locally in Derry, what, what, what have we lost? And, and the, the, the issue is 30 per cent. That was as before we just went into the last step. Yes. So we're lost and we're hemorrhaging and drivers. Uh, that figure could, could become a lot worse as we go through. You know, we're going into the, the, the period of time when taxi drivers are probably up to make their, their, their money that's going to get them through the Berlinus period, which is January and February. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to be hit and, and vaccine, I don't think a vaccine is going to come quick enough to stop a further lockdown in January. I mean, th these guys are self employed. Uh, the, the operators are dependent on them, and the operators are going to. They've already. The coffers are empty. We have done everything that they can do. The operators that we represent have done all they can to help the drivers, and now they need assistance to keep the operations open. The absence, and that's something that people should bear in mind. Think about life without taxis. Think about coming out of the pub and having to walk home, or the options, which is going to be getting in the, uh, a vehicle and people driving. Uh, while under the influence of drink. Think about all the hospital appointments that's going to be missed. Think about all the various things, the families that are moved in the middle of the night when, when housing executive or child services need people moved. These, these are all the gaps within, within the police phone up and say we need people took away from this or that, or the cars broke down, stuff in the motorways, all the different things, all the statutory service back up over and above what we do for the economy. What we do for the economy, bringing people into our city centres, all of that stuff there. All of that's going to be an absence if there's a collapse of the industry. Also, you've quite significantly invested in fleet, 
um, particularly for people with a disability. And I think that's the issue is that throughout the last number of months, a lot of people have stayed at home. That's been the government guidance. But people are going to need to get back out to go to hospital appointments and stuff like that. So if, that. If, if you think about it, the guidance Japan has to pull the plug on its computerised booking dispatch. A lot of smaller operators who, who have invested, as you have asked us to do, in, in wheelchair accessible vehicles. I mean, the dearest vehicles is going to be the first to go. We want to provide the services. We want to do the things that we said we would do. We have spent a lot of time working with you to develop it to where it's at. Now we're facing the point where we're going to be completely set back. Fifteen years. Just two questions. Uh, in relation to England, or England, Scotland, Wales and Republic of Ireland, are you aware of anything particular that they have done in, to assist taxi operators and, and taxi drivers around that? Because I'm conscious the £1,500 for taxi drivers is to be welcomed, but it's a paltry sum in the great context of everything, and support for yourselves is important to actually give that support for taxi drivers. And also, what engagement the Department of the Economy has had with yourselves in terms of support? I, I, I can answer that one. Um, uh, the schemes have varied across the, the four countries, um, and I think that certainly the Department was. Uh, proudly announced that the £1,500, which was announced for the drivers, was the biggest amount and the only scheme in place for taxi drivers across the UK at the time. Uh, there was a scheme announced yesterday to support drivers in Wales, uh, but there's been no uh, specific uh, uh, schemes announced for operators. Um, as far as the Department of the Economy for the Economy goes, um, we have uh, written to the Minister on a number of occasions, and we have yet to receive I suppose, a meaningful response. But anything formal which has been published in terms of Part B of the, the recent uh, – I always get this wrong uh, – CBRSS grant scheme. Grand scheme. And uh, uh, the scheme which was announced that specifically said in the paperwork that it excluded the taxi sector. And this came on the back of this came on the back of the minister for DFI saying that uh, a scheme would be forthcoming from economy that would help us. So we've got one saying the other will help, and the other one saying no, it's not my problem, unfortunately. So uh, hence the reason, part of the reason why we're back here today. If you were able to qualify for Part B, what, what, what effect would that have? Would that be? Part B, from a, a driver's perspective, there may well be some drivers who might be able to qualify for Part B if they're not eligible for the taxi driver support scheme, but the criteria around that isn't very clear. Uh, as far as the taxi operators being able to qualify for that scheme, um, it's an option if we were able to qualify, but the figures for the size of the businesses and the amounts that we have invested in drivers and their businesses wouldn't even start to cover uh, our losses. I think the um, Department for Infrastructure haven't already taken on the uh, coach operators scheme. I think it should be the people to handle the taxi operators scheme. You know, they've already been given powers down, I think, from the Office of First and Deputy First Minister to handle these schemes, um, yet they've decided for some reason to exclude half of the industry. So I think the Department for Infrastructure is the peop or are the people that should be actually handling the scheme. Um, but again, you know, we just want a scheme. We don't care who handles it, I suppose, at the end of the day. See, see just, just on that, the, the, the Department of the Environment and the committee worked to structure the taxi industry and the way it's structured. That, the benefits of that is the self-regulation and all the stuff that Stephen has pointed out. So you have structured it in that way. It's specific. We need what's said here, a bespoke scheme, which is said in the executive page, we need a bespoke scheme that deals with taxi operators. Could you structure this the way we are? Eamon, hey, Eamon yeah. very quickly. I have to respond, Michelle, to uh, the department's response there when they talked about uh, the grants that uh, taxi operators got in relation to the 10,000 rates relief. Every business in this country got the same, number one. Number two, there are about 200 coach operators that are going to avail of the current grant. At least 100 of those operators didn't avail of any rates grants because they only have one coach, and that coach is either parked at their house on a driveway, and they wouldn't avail for those reasons. They're not rate payers, you know. So I think that I think that has to be put on record. But, uh, the 10,000 that we got in relation to the rates, very welcome. But every business in this country got that 10,000 or 25, if the case was there. But at the end of the day, other businesses then availed of other grants, and we haven't. <coughs> Bring us in line with coach operators. 
there's about 200 of those people, and it's welcome that they get whatever help there is. We support that, but we, we have to ask the question, why have we been excluded? We don't know. Um, and there, we are speaking here today of probably 60 or 70 operators. There are 1,300 taxi operators in Northern Ireland. Most of them operate on a small license that only avails of two cars. We are the larger operators where we have current running expenses in our businesses of at least £3,000 to keep the stay open. Which are wages, or rent, or rates, whatever, telephones. And that's very important. The coach operators that operate there operate a slightly different business model, yes, but at the same time, our running expenses on a weekly basis will, will certainly be comparable to any coach operator. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, gentlemen, and, and Cathy there remotely. Uh, some of the questions obviously have been covered. Just a question I have regarding the, the currently used gentlemen and, and ladies cover the 40 operators, if I'm correct. Okay. Uh, and I just, you got answered one of the questions, the 1,300 taxi operators, roughly, in total. Whenever the Department of Infrastructure, and I'm looking at the point here, the implied assumption, you referred earlier about the implied assumption. Did the Department of Infrastructure ask the 1,300 operators or the 40 operators uh, for feedback? Sorry. For feedback, yeah. in other words, how you would develop the scheme. Four, four operators. Yeah, uh, the 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 four operators who. Sorry for cutting across you, sorry, but, uh, We were the we were the four operators who were originally represented and worked with the DFI. Uh, whenever um, as, as the face of the taxi industry till the DFI. <coughs> at the time, now that we were invited, we we didn't. Sorry, we made our case initially to ask questions and then to make a case for financial support. We were brought forward as representatives of the sector, but we didn't claim to represent the sector. Whenever, um, whenever we were given the rebuttal by the ministers, uh, the minister and the officials, uh, what we then started to do was expand this group. We started to ask: Was everybody else feeling the so, same financial so pressures? At, at that point, used four businesses have been what, 70 per cent of taxi drivers, roughly. No, the the 40 businesses that are listed would be the 70 per cent okay. of drivers. Okay, yes. sorry. So some of the four, fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but what we did was uh, uh, many operators know many other operators in the business, so uh, we each spoke to other operators and said, "Well, look, what are the what are the problems you're experiencing? Are you going through the same issues as we are? Uh, would you like to be part of uh, an initiative that we're bringing forward to try and get support?" And we got an absolutely from everybody. Uh, I also, and I'm quite happy to send these through to the committee afterwards. Uh, I've redacted the names on these, but I've also been sent some letters from some of these operators who are part of this group saying some of the hardship that they're going through uh, across the industry. And uh, Eamon quoted one of them up in Straban. And there's a very high stress out there. There's a, a very real fear of losing the business and losing their homes. So this does affect everyone across the province. And that's why I said, while we don't represent the industry, I think between the 40 of us and the number of drivers we have, especially considering that uh, I suppose Phonacab and ValueCab being the two biggest operators, we would be 70 per cent plus probably of the overall number of drivers in Northern Ireland. Christopher, did you want to come in? No, that was just, I just wanted to say we had letters from other operators there, which we'd like to leave with you, obviously, today as well. Okay, and with, with respect to those, those um, 40 businesses, and many of those received the rates or received the, the, the £10,000 support, um, roughly? Um, uh, on those, we don't have specific figures. Um, in the time that we had available to us, uh, we didn't have the chance to get into that level of granularity. Uh, what we did ask them to do was to come back and talk about if they had received any grant funding outside of uh, okay. what uh, some of the bigger operators, some of the ones in this group, had received. Uh, many of them, as Eamon will have said, would have been smaller operators who, in some instances, will have been operating perhaps from home, so they wouldn't have received anything. Your understanding at the start, whether it be the, the negotiations or discussions with DFI at the start, it was going to be operators and taxi Absolutely. We engaged, as, we engaged as a sector. We engaged uh, because while we are operators, uh, as Christopher said, as my colleagues have said here, we're two sides of one coin. Uh, anything that benefits the drivers, yes, will benefit uh, the operators if it's done correctly. Anything that benefits the operators. So we engaged as a sector, expecting that there would be support for the sector, drivers and operators. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr Hilditch, Deputy Chair. 
Thanks, Chair. You're very welcome this morning, gentlemen. I appreciate your presentation. I did learn some degree of it last week. I met with my hoods in Carrick Fergus. Diamond. Um, Diamond, yeah. He's uh, obviously filled me in on a lot of what was going on and what was happening in your campaign. So I don't really have too many questions as such. Other than to say that I certainly support you in your in, in your uh, quest to, to be treated the same as others within the transport industry. And, and when I was talking to, to, to him in, in relation to being a provincial town, obviously, there he, he was reckoning his business was probably down around 20 to 30 per cent of what it usually would be. I suppose that would be a fair reflection across the board. It, it has ebbed and flowed. Uh, Phonocab, the week before lockdown in March, did 119,000 bookings. Uh, the week after lockdown, we did 19,000 bookings. That's less than 20 per cent in one week. Now, it grew. Uh, it grew probably to around about 65 to 70 per cent over the summer with Eat Out to help out and so on. But then with the lockdowns not coming back in, we're back around about 40 per cent again. Now, if you average that out over the course of the year, would we have hit an average of 50 per cent? I doubt it. So. I appreciate that. And also learned of what the operator in that case was doing for his drivers as well, which was you know, pushing it out. That's why it's even more disappointing to find have been annexed out of things at this stage. Uh, St Stephen, you, you did mention in, in a comment that in, in relation to uh, you, the industry had subsidised others to remain operational. What? Well, what happens is um, uh, it's a, a strange relationship between driver and uh, operator in that the drivers are all self-employed and effectively what the driver does is the driver pays the operator uh, to provide him with bookings, to provide him to sign the roof, to provide him with customer service, lost property, credit cards, account payments, all these different functions which we resource. So um, uh, whenever uh, the drivers weren't getting the level of business that they needed to sustain them, uh, we, like many others, cut uh, the amount that we were charging uh, drivers to work to either zero, or in some cases, it's been back maybe at 50, 60 per cent. So when you mentioned others, then that was the drivers you were it, Absolutely. To. It just wondered about who the others were. Well, uh, the, there's, there's perhaps another way to look at that, in that Phonacab is a name that you'll see on the arm of many football teams around Northern Ireland. We support the IFA, we support An Antrim uh, Gaelic Club, we support St Paul's GAC. We were the main sponsor of the North West 200. Last year, we paid for the Christmas dinners for uh, the inpatients at the hospice. We're not in a position to do much of this. And if we are in a position to do it now, we're doing it to a much lesser extent. So the support that we all give to our communities uh, extends well beyond just subsidising the driver's depot rent. No, appreciate it and, and good luck with it. You're not the only one. There's other sectors where there's... Absolutely. It's grey areas as well. One of the big rows brewing at the minute is between clubs and pubs, and the disparities of funding there as well, which will affect you guys at the end of yep. the day too. Yep. So uh, the rest of my questions have been asked. Okay, thank you, um, Ms. Anderson. Uh, going well, good, all of you, for for the uh, presentation, and I'm, I'm going to actually pick up on what Christopher's point when he described you as an industry, because we've had the taxi drivers. You have presented in front of us as well, and um, they have also given testimonies that are heartfelt and sore. And given that the Department uh, for Infrastructure regulates the industry in its totality, I am at a loss. I have to say I am baffled as to, and I am not the only MLA that is receiving heartfelt testimonies from taxi drivers whose partners maybe ended up unfortunately being diagnosed with cancer. Children, the same, ended up in hospital, had to choose between paying their insurance or suspending it temporarily, and are now being told they're locked out of a scheme. And I'm sitting listening to yourselves in the knowledge that on the 23rd of October, the Minister asked for the powers under the Financial Assistance Act. And on the 24th of October, the next day, on a Saturday, she received those powers. And a statement was released by the Executive Office. And Mrs. Foster, or Minister Foster said that the powers was going to give financial support to the operators of taxis 
private buses and coaches. When I read that statement that day, I was under the assumption, as everyone else was, I believe, that you were being covered. On the 26th of October, two days later, the minister received 19 million. She asked for 6 million to be put aside, she asked for 25 million and 19 million, so that the schemes would be put in place. I think it's somewhat offensive to hear that you may have received 10 or 25 million. The economy, <laughs> or thou, thousand, sorry, <laughs> if only here. chance would be a fine thing, <laughs> 10 or 25,000. All businesses that were eligible at that time received either 10 or 25,000 away back in the first lockdown. So, Chair, I'm at a loss as to what else we can do. We have asked the Minister to review the criteria that is preventing, for instance, taxi drivers who suspended temporarily their insurance so that they could get access to the scheme. I've had emails one taxi driver because four days he was under cancer treatment. He was released from hospital. By the time he got his insurance, there was a four-day gap and has been refused. One of the taxi drivers says to me yesterday, I feel like a beggar. My son is recovering from cancer treatment and I don't feel I have to put this on display. Please don't name me. And I think it's outrageous what is, I, I don't understand, Chair. I have no questions for you because I don't know what to say to you because we have asked for you to be included in the same way as bus operators, as coach operators. I don't understand the exclusion. I have to say for the drivers, because the Part B of the, um, of the COVID support scheme on the Department for the Economy, I don't understand why he's being excluded from that. But the Department for Infrastructure is your operator. They, it, it's the department that, ha, that regulates you. And when I listen to you talk about some of the, the actions that you take and some of the services you provide, on Friday, we're opening the North in terms of the economy. There are people going to be going out to pubs and clubs, and we don't want them taking their cars. And we want them to get home safely. And we want enough drivers to be on the streets. We all know at times when, I don't know about the rest of maybe your cities, but in Derry, sometimes when people all get out of the pubs and clubs at the same time, so it's hard to get it. Uh, to get these it are the taxi. most popular in demand people that people are looking for at that time to get a taxi, to get home safely. And I can just give you my and our absolute support, but we're, we're in the mouth of Christmas. And both the operators for yourselves, for your businesses, and the taxi drivers mm. need support. So I just want to give you my support, and I don't know if you have any other comment to make uh, in relation to anything else that perhaps that we could do in the few days and weeks okay. before we close. I know Christopher wants to comment. And I'll move to Liz. Sorry, just on, the, on what you were saying about the driver's situation, um, at the meeting with the department, we fully supported the driver's scheme. Yeah. We also suggested on the insurance side that as long as the driver had insurance on the start of COVID, then they should be included in it. And we're still, at, we're still supporting that at the moment. And it's no. my understanding, Chair, that, is, is it that the taxi drivers, they still have a taxi policy? Yes, that's right. That's right. So they're uh, designated uh, taxis, taxi, yeah. taxi, taxi I mean, our, our rent reductions within our own company um, has, has come out to around £2,300 per driver, which is actually more than the government has given the drivers. You know, so it, we are supporting the drivers and we fully support the drivers all the way through this. Okay. Thank you. Liz. Okay. Uh, no, thank you all. I, I mean, it, this has certainly been an eye-opener for myself. I've kind of, you know, as, as my colleagues have said there, we had met with the taxi drivers. Um, and you know, unless sometimes you're in, you're in uh, the sector, you don't always realise the wider impact. So really appreciate um, you coming to meet us today. And, and like all, I suppose a lot of the questions I had have, have been answered throughout the discussion this morning. Um, I, I can't understand uh, why you have been excluded. Um, you know, and and Cathy had mentioned there about local bars. I'm in Murray, obviously, and, and I've seen that too, where they're advertising then make sure you have your, your transport pre-arranged to reopen this weekend. The bottom line here for me is that throughout this pandemic, taxi drivers, taxi operators have been deemed as an essential service because that's what you are. You complement all of these other sectors, hospitality, the health service, all of those were, as uh, Stephen said at the start, you know, 
people need the service because they have another option a lot of the time as well. So they're heavily reliant on it. And when when you are unable to sustain um, the provision of that service because of the financial difficulties you're facing, then we need to step up and we need to make sure that the supports are to get you to the other side of it. Um, and I think part of it too, you know, we're obviously going into a, re a relaxation of restrictions for, for the Christmas period, which will see restaurants and, and shops and things reopening. Um, and without transport, as Martina alluded to there, people are all gathering in areas, waiting on, on taxis, waiting on transport to get them home safely. We're going to be facing another spike in this virus because, you know, we have to make sure there's a steady flow of people that we aren't that they're not caught up in areas in big um, crowds, and I mean, that, that, to me, that's a that's a basic element of, of this whole thing. I suppose apologies if I've missed this throughout the discussion. There's just one question I had around um, engagement with the department. I know Stephen had said that the, the kind of repeated response he's getting is that it's a political decision. Since the um, you know since it came to light that the decision was taken to exclude operators, has there been any response from the department to even explain why? Um, why the why they've excluded operators? Um, you know, on, on how they felt. You know, because as, as others have said, we we've been, we've been fighting very hard for taxi drivers, taxi operators, coach operators, and also the haulage sector who have still are still excluded. And, and like yourselves, they also need a book package because one size doesn't fit all for a lot of the issues that have been outlined from yourselves and from them. So um, we will continue to to highlight that until support is made available but it was just to see was there any sort of detail provided on that and why it's been excluded if I, if I may answer that chair the response that you read from the minister this morning detailing the reason why support wasn't given to the operators was remarkably similar to the last formal response that we got from the operators uh, so we've tried to refute that with the officials uh, and that's where we came up with uh, uh, that would be a political decision uh, response back from them yeah, and have any other meetings been scheduled? Uh, we, we didn't come today with a proposal because we appreciate that's not the responsibility of this committee. Uh, we would hope that the committee would give us the support and uh, perhaps, for want of a better term, apply the pressure to allow us to engage again with the officials to try and put a scheme into place. Um, we also are very conscious that we're in the run-up to Christmas here and uh, th this panel will uh, rest over Christmas as well much of the activity of government. So we're conscious of the need to move this forward quickly. So any support that we can get to try and uh, get in front of officials with a meaningful uh, discussion about how we <coughs> introduce a uh, support package urgently would be uh, very, very welcomed. Sorry, Thank just you, a quick point on that. So, Stephen, you, you have, in, in terms of your engagement, there hasn't been any uh, provision of facts or figures yet to the department? In terms uh, back, back when we engaged as a sector, uh, uh, before the driver scheme was uh, introduced, uh, the department did ask us to detail what grants we'd received and what financial losses we had incurred. And we uh, we detailed that at the time. Some of us, we, we gave our answers in different ways, but for NACAB, we were quite detailed in terms of the amount of money and so on. So a lot of that groundwork has been done, but since the driver scheme was announced, we haven't had any engagement on facts or figures. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Kelly, and then Mr. Beggs. Okay, thank you, Chair, and thanks very much for your presentation. It's good to see you all again. But to my mind, there are a number of issues, and of course, we have very detailed correspondence from uh, Minister Mallon to the Minister of Economy in relation to Part B restrictions, were, uh, uh, the new regulations in terms of financial assistance from the Department of Economy uh, is very much in support of those sectors who might not have had to close down as a consequence of the regulations, but whose service provision relied upon uh, those. So I can, for the life of me, understand why uh, the taxi industry is excluded. Uh, from that section. I think that's something that we would seek maybe to refer to the uh, Economy Committee. And it may be, be something that could be legally challenged as well, just as a, a, a group uh, yourselves. I, I, I think that falls far short. Uh, going back to October, when the executive uh, conferred uh, varies onto the uh, Depart uh, Infrastructure Minister uh, to assist with financial assistance packages, because uh, I did give an undertaking to go and find out, it was around overhead costs. And I think that's where we could explore 
further with the Department of Infrastructure because um, the taxi operators, as I understand it, you've been able to avail of um, the rates relief and the furlough. And, but because of the licence that you have, that you have certain obligations uh, to adhere to in order to retain your licence and to operate legally, there are some overhead costs that arguably could be looked at within a financial assistance overhead package. That's how I see it, um, um, Chair. You know that, that that seems to be where some of the, the discrepancy lies, and then uh, where, where the differential lies in terms of the. Um, uh, the coaches. I mean, I think that's one that we need to explore further uh, with the department. You know, what was different about the coach industry that, in terms of the fleet, that doesn't apply to the taxi operator sector? Uh, that's where I have um, questions around and arising, and, and I see there being two or three uh, courses of action. Sorry, Dolores, thank you. Um, depending on the size, I suppose, of the operation, they're all different models, as mm -hmm. I said to you. I mean, we have a rent to own scheme within our company where we have 300 taxis are provided on rent to own schemes to drivers. So we have a very large capital uh, outlay of cars sitting and a lot of cars back in our yards. I mean, we have 60 or 70 used cars mm -hmm. sitting at the moment in storage where drivers have just returned them and they're not paying yeah. any payments. Yeah. We as a company have all of those vehicles on finance. Yes. You know, so all of those vehicles are being paid for by ourselves, uh -huh. but there's no mirror income coming against those. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so we are very like the coach industry. And again, I think when the powers come down um, to the minister, to adhere these or to operate these schemes, um, we can't see where the difference has come from the coach operators to the taxi operators. Mm -hmm. I mean, the powers were given to her to operate a scheme for both, and how she's decided not to operate a scheme for the taxi operators while she's operating the scheme for the coach operators, I cannot see where the difference is. Eamon? Sorry, I am conscious of time, Michelle. I've just got to I got I got to stress that out towards Antrim Ballymena direction. Even more so, at taxi operators like my own and TC Bros in, in Ballymena and E Cabs in Ballymena. But there's about 10 devils, probably, or operators across the country that operate like us, where we have a mixture of owner drivers, but also where we own the cars and we buy the cars and we insure the cars. And indeed, I have looked at this, I went obviously and looked to try and find out some answers, but the, like, the, biggest, the biggest injustice that I can see here is insurance for most taxis out towards Ballymena Antrim. Some of us guys are paying three grand per car for insurance. There's coach operators only paying 1800 per bus. It's, it's unreal that, and I mean, our overheads are as big or more than, than coach operators. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bag. Oh, Eamon. Uh, it's just to say that, see, see at the start, when the, the, the whole bunging everybody together, I mean, for North West taxi proprietors, we, we were, I was up to represent both drivers and operators because that, that's just the way that the operators wanted it to go. <coughs> we were probably top heavy on, on, on the, the difficulty, the desperation that was out there for drivers. but. There needed to be a separation of, of the drivers and the operators they deal with, which is we found all down the years when we were doing the different aspects of, of, of a thing, uh, and and that that's where part of the confusion comes in because when you're talking about all, all the overheads, at times when you're talking about the overheads of drivers, and then you're talking about the overheads of offices in a meeting where people are nearly competing for time, it nearly becomes where where, where maybe some of the officials didn't didn't fully grasp mm -hmm. everything that was going on. But what, what, where we're at now is that this department, or well, earlier the Department of the Environment, structured the industry the way they structured it. They structured it similar with the operator licences, the, the, the other, the coach, to the haulage, and, and we went with it. The bespoke scheme that we need needs to come from the Department of the Infrastructure, needs to be uh, addressing the issues that they set up. No, I'm not accusing. Or saying, I'm not, that's not accusing. I'm not saying. Absolutely. Nicola Mallon mightn't have been on. Like, it was Arlene Foster would have been the minister when we set the structures up. If my memory serves me right, maybe it went on about Carol Avda and, and <laughs> some of the others. But it was set up through here. That whole structure of the industry, the operator licensing, 
is similar to the code chapter. We should have a bespoke scheme similar to that. It should come through the Department of Infrastructure. Our understanding was from the executive committee or the executive statement that support will be forthcoming, uh, and we took it that it, that it would be coming. And, and I think possibly some of the the, the mis- understanding, if, if we could put it that way, from the department, is because people were competing for different aspects. It should have been separated out. They need to listen to us. They need to listen to the hardship. They need to listen to the loss. They need to listen to the cliff aids that we went over. And they need to listen. Uh, and, and we believe that we should get a, a scheme, a bespoke scheme, coming out of infrastructure for operators. Sorry, Chair, can I just come back on one point? Um, what I'm not clear about um, um, is, in terms of the Part B of the economy, you know, but wh- where's the better fit for yourselves? I mean, uh, there's the there's the limited um, up, um, power that the infrastructure minister has in terms of the financial hardship packages, and that's one thing. But in terms of the exclusion from Part B of the COVID current help. What difference would that make? Have, have you looked at to say, if you were eligible to apply for that, what difference would that make to the situation that you find yourselves in? Um, from, uh, well, I think a couple of things. First of all, that the part yeah. B of the current scheme is only to address the current lockdown. Yes. It doesn't address most of the losses okay. and costs incurred over the first okay. six months. And whenever we started this process, part B didn't exist. Mm-hmm. I think that certainly, yes, if we were eligible for part B, we would uh, seriously be looking at it as an addendum to uh-huh. any scheme which has been put in place by DFI, but uh, as a standalone scheme, it wouldn't be sufficient. For okay, that. thank you. That's see, helpful. See, just okay. one the other part of yeah. it. Yeah. As we say, one, it's not one size fits all. No, I understand. We noticed that and we structured it. Mm-hmm. Everything's been fitted through the operator and the operator numbers. The way we pay our fees to the department mm-hmm. is based on the operator, and then you have the granting scheme for the operator numbers. So we would see that the, the, any bespoke scheme coming out would have something for the operator, and like the granting mm-hmm. scheme will come with the numbers. Yeah, no. yeah, that's basically where we're no, coming that, from. That's very helpful, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Beggs. Uh, thanks for your, your presentation. Um, I'm certainly alarmed at the financial picture that you're, you're painting and uh, living off loans and a and, uh, degree of cliff edge that might be approaching some particularly smaller operators, but perhaps larger ones too. Um, Cathy had indicated that um, drivers had been leaving, probably mainly during the lar- larger lockdown. Would that have been the period where you would have lost most drivers? Yes, but the problem is that those that have left, um, out of the in and around 40% of them left, we now have 35% of drivers who, when I'm talking to them, said they are not sure that they're coming back into the industry. They um, have alternative maybe work and they're doing that maybe on a part-time basis and they're just not sure of the stability around it. They've also got families to look after. It's in the mouth of Christmas. So my problem is for seeing, I, I can't see them coming back because they're moving on now. Okay. And, and there's also an indication that you estimate only 60 to 70, some 60 to 70 percent of drivers you think actually applied for the driver grant. Oh, yeah. That's DFI's figures. We believe that the yeah. DFI said there was five and a half thousand drivers had applied okay. for the grant. Uh, the figures for licensed taxi drivers in Northern Ireland are around about nine thousand. Have you picked up any reason why you think why so many wouldn't have applied? Is that people who've left the industry, uh, or is that or is that people who have not been sufficiently capable to do the paperwork? Both of those uh, and many more. I think that the average age of a taxi driver for us is around about 55 years old. M- many of these people are not, unfortunately, computer literate. Uh, they're not following the news which is going out on the NI Direct website. They're not reading the chatter which goes on, on the social media platforms. A lot of them will uh, uh, invariably as well say, well, uh, from what I've heard from other drivers, what's the point in me applying? Uh, we've got a, a, a little bit of that as well. But uh, there's not one reason why they haven't applied. I think just a lot of them have felt excluded. Have you any indication of the proportion of drivers that would uh, work for yourselves that may have taken the insurance holiday? And that, I understand, was one of the conditions that excluded them. Have you any indication what numbers of your own drivers would have been excluded by that? We probably could get that for Phonacab. Um, the drivers, by and large, arrange their own insurance, and then uh, what will happen is they have to give us a copy of their insurance certificate. Now, w- what we did, in the same way as many other operators, if a driver chose not to work uh, in the early days, we didn't charge them anything for holding on to their car, but we did ask that it maintain some form of insurance because they couldn't have one of our vehicles 
Uh, sorry, this didn't apply to owner drivers. This applied to ones who were on a rent to buy scheme. We did ask that if they wanted to hold onto their car and not pay uh, for that car, they needed to have some sort of insurance just to cover any liability. Many of them kept their taxi insurance in place. Some of them chose to move to social, domestic, and pleasure. So we we, we probably could get get that information. Um, and uh, we could probably give you an idea of how many of our drivers have applied for the scheme as well. In your presentation, you, you've um, helpfully painted the picture that you are providing a key service, you know, delivering patients to hospital, moving blood around, organs, etc. Um, so I think uh, we all should be listening here to make sure that there is a viable service going, going forward. Um, you also indicated you've had to incur significant costs maintaining your depot to maintain your operator license? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the maintenance of the depot and the operator's license are two slightly different things. And by that I mean uh, we are headquartered up at Knock Road. So like many businesses, our offices are full of perspex and face masks and stay two metre apart uh, stickers on the ground. Uh, we've also, uh, because uh, on the very first day of lockdown, uh, we operate three different contact centres, one in Belfast, one in Lisburn and one in Newry. We moved everyone to home working. Uh, home working in a nine to five job uh, means one computer for one member of staff. But because we work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that, in order to continue our operation, that means three computers to be bought uh, for three shifts at home. So we incurred significant expense for all of the changes to our offices. We can incurred significant expense for enabling our staff to move to home working, things like uh, Microsoft licenses and all the rest of it. Now, uh, that's a lot of the cost, but some of those things, the home working is obviously nothing to do with our license in itself. But the functions that need, we needed to maintain, uh, providing dispatch for our drivers, providing a booking service for our passengers, uh, phone a cab uh, in full flight, we would get up to 10,000 items of lost property every single year. Uh, everything from uh, wheelchairs to false teeth to glasses to mobile phones, mobile phones being a popular one. You have to have a system to be able to reunite uh, reunite people with their lost property. And that requires, that requires IT, that requires a, storage, a secure storage area, that requires somebody to actually take all the inquiries, match it up with uh, the owner and return it to the owner. Now, we are under the terms of operator's licence, just in terms of lost property. We have to provide that service. Thinking of some of the smaller operators, would you have lost your licence if you just closed your doors because you're, you know, you're so small a trade at one point? Closing our doors would, in many ways, have been the easy option. Uh, but that would have let down, in our case, all of our drivers, all of our customers, all of our corporate customers. And that would have caused, um, we, we've talked here today about the impact on uh, potentially drink driving. Can you imagine Belfast on a Saturday night with the pubs emptying out without a value cab or a phone cab being there? Not only would there be drink driving, there would be antisocial behaviour, there would be police on the streets. Dare I said you would have seen, you see it every week on social media, is anyone doing lifts? The unregulated sector is out there. They would have stepped in and you would have had uninsured problems all over the place. We could not close. We had to stay open. We had to stay open for the benefit of our drivers. We had to stay open for the benefit of the blood transfusion service, the dialysis unit, all of those customers. We had to stay open and we're all exactly the same. I fully appreciate you all provide a vital service to the community. Um, and I'm trying to understand literally what will happen if, if you're not supported and if operators, more operators go out of business, um, how long does it take? I mean, you mentioned it takes time for even an individual driver to go through a process. How long does it take for a, a, a driver to get a, a taxi driver's licence? How long does it take an operator to get an operator's licence? I'm assuming it takes a considerable amount of time and oh, extra fill a void. For a driver. He'll, he'll probably hate me for saying this, but uh, our training manager. Uh, is a qualified teacher and has a, a master's and he failed his theory test the first time 
uh, whenever he did it. Uh, you have to do a theory test. You have to be. No one tell him that. He, uh, you, have to test, you have to pass a medical. You have to uh, be access NI cleared. You have to have uh, a number of years' experience on your own licence. There are five different aspects to uh, hurdles to get over in order to become a, uh, a taxi driver. Uh, the requirements on, uh, regardless of the requirements on the operator for our operator's licence, we have to manage all of our drivers to make sure they have all of that, that they are equipped to be able to go out and do their job. We also have to be able to manage everything from helping them uh, apply for Access NI, uh, doing a lot of the paperwork which uh, enables them to uh, register with the, the, the DVA in the first place. So. Uh, the, there's a, a big requirement on a taxi driver to get into the industry, regardless of the cost, because as a startup taxi driver, insurance is going to be big for the first few years. He's going to have to incur the cost of a car and all the rest. So of it. Just to answer the question, how long it takes? Oh, sorry. We, we would run a bespoke training course for tax, bringing people into the taxi industry. Uh, a quick licence will be four months, and it can take longer depending. And you have to remember, different people with different educational uh, ability. And then, in the past, because you used to be able to just get a licence, there is some people who need a, a, a lot of help to get in because they would have uh, so, some issues with their, their literacy and numeracy and stuff like that. So there, you have to help with other things before you get them the actual taxi licence in some cases. But a quick licence is four months, uh, an average licence probably five, six months. In some of the more isolated uh, rural towns, and there wouldn't be perhaps the same level of competition as there would be in Belfast, and there might be a service provided by one or, or, or two taxi taxi operators. Um, so I'm very conscious: should they go out of business, there could be no a complete dearth mm. of taxis Disaster. to provide it at all. So how long would it take someone new stepping forward saying, no, "I want to provide a service"? to get all the operators licensed? That was the question I haven't heard an answer to. Well, if I can say just one very quick thing on that is, is that if the market doesn't recover, who would want to go in and provide that service? Well, I, I appreciate that, but at some point we will, we will come through it. But the question is how many taxi operators will still be around whenever mm -hmm. we get through this thing. That, yeah. That's my, my concern. There, at some point with, with the, uh, the uh, vaccine, I, I, I'm hopeful that things will get much better, but there's still some time to go. And I'm trying to see how long it would take for a new operator, perhaps next summer, to come on the scene. And before, before a new operator would even start, if he had a premises, say, just for argument's sake, because I know your constituency in Larne, and he wanted to open up a premises as a, as a taxi depot, first of all, he has to get planning permissions to open that. So, how long it will take planning? It will take a few months. And then after that, he has to go through the other processes, access NI for himself, and then uh, employers' liability insurance and things like that. It probably would take three or four months minimum. Okay, so I'm just highlighting that we, we all should be concerned that there could be a complete dearth of the service, of a key service in, in many areas, if uh, uh, some sort of support is not provided. If, if you take the gap that the smaller Oper operators are going to leave the ones that go out. We have some have went out of business, and the gap that it's going to leave in communities. You know, it is uh, it, immediately in the pandemic we were, we were deemed an essential service. We were asked the question, are we allowed to work? We asked the question, we're an emergency service. The gap of small operators dis disappearing is the, the, that personal contact. It, it's it's a taking that person. To the supermarket, it's picking people up. It's all the vulnerable people that have to be transported within, and, and all the, the, the safeguards which have been put in place by the committee over over the years. All of that goes out the window. When we didn't have regulated offices, we had incidents. As Martina will we'll be aware, we, we had people picked up. There, there, we were dealing with rape cases. We were dealing with uh, all sorts of antisocial. We were dealing with people driving in. Predators were able to come in, just drive in. Somebody jumps in a car. Mm. You're opening the door to all of that. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I've, I've probably gone well over our time. Um, but can I, I thank you very much for coming this morning. Obviously, members um, were interested in what you said, and I hope that you felt that you had the opportunity to. To put your case to us, and certainly as a committee, we will relay that then to the department. Yep. Thank you all thank very you. much. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. Thanks thank very much. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.
Okay, members, if you are content that we, we do actually write to the department um, outlying the issues that have been highlighted here today, and I do think that there probably is something that we need to return to as a committee just in relation to access to um, for drivers uh, that we may look at in the new year, Mr Beggs. One thing that came to light there is there may be so much that's delegated to the Minister at the minute, so we, we need clarity as to whether or not... Um, Further delegation of authority is needed from OFMD, after Executive Office, in order that um, uh, additional support may be given. Okay, well, um, I think we, if we can explore um, all of that, um, and hopefully we can get a response fairly quickly um, as well, um, because it, I think it would be unfortunate if we had to wait until um, we come back in January, um, just given the, the period that we're in. And obviously the issues that they're they're currently facing. Sorry, Miss Anderson. Um, Chair, I don't think we can wait until January. I mean, we have asked the last time we had the tra taxi drivers in for an amendment to be made to the regulation so that the issue of the insurance could be resolved. And we're now hearing that the operators have not been included. So whatever, like we can put in emergency questions or urgent questions, we need this committee urgently replied to, and or hopefully member, with a resolution. Or if it might be helpful, um, we could ask if officials could come to the, to mm. the committee next, next week. Um, and we'll be started at an earlier time, if that's, if that's a possibility to do that. Mm. Because I just think given we're at the timing of all of this, um, it is quite critical. Okay, Chair. members, um, mindful also that we have two further presentations. Chair, we have before we, are, we, are we agreeing also to write about the Part B regulations to the Economy Committee? I'll do that as well. Yeah, because I think that's critical, you know, in terms of, of the totality uh, of the package. And uh, I'm not adverse to the officials coming because there is clearly a lack of understanding or misrepresentation in, in terms of uh, the a scheme. Okay, um, now just moving on to the next two items of business. We've run over quite considerably. Um, we have NIE and then we have officials in relation to um, major road projects. Um, are you content that we still continue with the two presentations, but be very mindful that this is going to be truncated? Or will we ask officials to come back at a later date with here? regards oh. to major projects? What time do we have? Then? We have until 1.30. Sorry. No, we have until one o'clock. Sorry, we've yeah. until one o'clock. We have an hour and a half. Time for one. I think there's notice in all of us to keep our questions to a yeah, well, minimum and no commentary. That, you know, if we're just ask questions. Okay. Could I also okay. chair asked for the officials? We don't need the pre if we have the presentation sent to us. We don't need to go through the presentation um, in the same way just okay. to take up time because we're conscious of the time okay, we'd like to. Of an exchange. Okay, thank yeah, you. Um, moving then to um, item 10, which is a briefing from NIE in relation to infrastructure for green recovery. Can I apologise, first of all, in relation to our lateness? Obviously, our last item of business ran on quite considerably, but you'll appreciate um, the issues that, we're, that we were discussing with regards to that. Um, we do have a briefing paper at page 288 and then a PowerPoint presentation, which is our table papers at page 8. Hansard will record this session of the meeting. And can I welcome um, Paul Stapleton, who is the Managing Director, and Randall Gilbert, the Head of Network Strategy. You're both very welcome to the committee this morning. And if you would like to take us through um, briefly through your presentation, then we'll open up to, to members. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, all. And, uh we appreciate the opportunity to present this morning and appreciate your time is, is scarce, so we'll, 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 we'll press on with this. Um, I'll just go briefly through the presentation, uh, starting with page two. I suppose the key message I'd like to highlight on, on this is NIE Networks is a significant investor in infrastructure in Northern Ireland, and as you'll appreciate, the electricity infrastructure will play a key role in supporting climate action and delivering net zero carbon uh, in this society. The electricity infrastructure is also a key enabler of other areas of infrastructure which would more, more directly come under the remit of this committee, including roads, transport and water. <coughs> Very little development in this economy does not have a dependency on the electricity infrastructure in, in one way or another. So turning to slide three and, and the policy context. You'll be aware the UK Government is committing very substantial investment in infrastructure to support de decarbonisation 
with a particular emphasis on stimulating the economy after the, the COVID uh, pandemic. Just last month, um, the Prime Minister announced a 10-point plan for a green industrial revolution, which commits $12 billion in government investment and anticipates leveraging that three times further with private, inv private sector investment in, in, in clean energy and the, the broader green industrial revolution. And that is anticipated to create 250,000 green jobs by 2030. Our concern, Chair, is how much of that will come to Northern Ireland and will Northern Ireland be left behind in this agenda. There is a process to develop an energy strategy that will run till the end of next year, and we can expect legislative changes arising maybe to go into 2022. We believe we don't need to wait until the end of that process, and we've highlighted in a previous paper published uh, in October, which we presented to the Economy Committee, we highlighted eight areas where we believe action can be taken now to, to progress on this journey, both in terms of the economy and moving to net zero carbon. And um, this morning, we'd like to touch on three of those specific areas which more directly relate to the, the remit of this committee. That's around low carbon transport, the planning process, and connections to the electricity network. So turning to slide four, um, the UK has announced, the UK government has announced its intention to bring forward the banning of combustion engine vehicles to 2030. So, in less than 10 years' time, we won't be able to buy, to buy a petrol or diesel car. Um, that we, will anti we anticipate will lead to a major acceleration in the demand for electric vehicles. And analysis we've got done recently suggests that there could be of the order of 400,000 electric vehicles on the roads of Northern Ireland by 2030. The current charging infrastructure is totally inadequate to meet even the needs of a fraction of that. The most significant barrier, as we see it, to rolling out public electric vehicle charging infrastructure here at the moment is funding. Some of the other issues, including the issue of permitted development rights, is being addressed. The issue of charging uh, for, for the electricity used in those charge points is being addressed by the utility regulator. But the remaining issue relates to funding. And it's too early in the life cycle of electric vehicles for commercial investment in, in charging infrastructure. So it needs to be, as is happening certainly in England and across the, the, the Scotland and Wales, also have strategies in this area. It's been primed with public investment. For Northern Ireland, we believe the options are public investment or investment through the electricity bills, and we are willing to play a role in that if that, if, if that is considered the optimal option or a combination of both, and maybe if there's either of those implied, it might be enough to attract at least matching private investment. But we don't believe private sector on its own will take on this in the short term until there's enough electric vehicles on the road to justify it. So our, our view is that all the relevant stakeholders need to be brought together, including representatives of the motor industry, electric vehicle drivers, the, the current operators of the infrastructure, um, local councils, um, led by the Department for Infrastructure to find a way forward. And as I said, NIE Networks is willing to, to play our role in that. Our primary role in this space is to make sure the electricity network is fit to take the charging infrastructure. But if there's a need for us to play a role in the charging infrastructure itself, we're prepared to, prepared to do that subject to an appropriate regulatory recovery model. Turning to the next slide and the issue of the planning process. <clears throat> And to start, I suppose, to acknowledge some positive developments in relation to planning for the energy sector recently, including the issue I mentioned there around permitted development rights for EV charging infrastructure, and also the Minister's decision to approve planning for the North-South interconnector, which is a key strategic project. But notwithstanding that progress, we believe significant reform is needed in the, to the planning process if we are to deliver the infrastructure needed to achieve net zero carbon and specifically specifically to achieve 70% renewables by 2030, which is the target the Minister has set of at least 70%. Planning decisions for major development in Northern Ireland typically take much longer than comparable projects in GB or indeed in the Republic of Ireland. Our target here for major development is 30 weeks. Our analysis suggests in practice that tends to be of the order of 53 weeks. The equivalent target in GB, which is met most of the time, not all of the time, but most of the time, is 13 weeks. So there's a very significant difference. We believe there's a need for a new strategic spatial planning strategy for Northern Ireland that will properly align with planning 
with the, with the energy strategy so that infrastructure can be planned and delivered in a coordinated way. And it will put an emphasis on prioritising or fast-tracking clean, clean energy infrastructure or clean infrastructure generally that will support uh, a zero-carbon economy. We have seen some good practice examples of that in other jurisdictions, notably Scotland, where the national planning framework gives priority to low-carbon development, and also New Zealand, where very soon after the COVID pandemic they introduced a legislation for a temporary fast-track planning process to support clean infrastructure investment uh, to help stimulate the economy after the, the COVID pandemic. The recent uh, Ministerial Advisory Panel um, report recommends the establishment of an infrastructure commission to advise on long-term infrastructure planning for all key areas of infrastructure in Northern Ireland, including energy. We believe that would be a very welcome step, but I think it is particularly important that energy is included in that, and it, it would be a mistake to limit the scope of that commission to just the scope of infrastructure that falls under the remit of the Minister and the Department. And the final point I want to make on this topic is community support and effective communi community engagement is always critical to planning. So we are not advocating a planning process that comes to faster, faster decisions at the expense of community engagement. And we believe there is a process which should allow community and stakeholder input but still deliver decisions much quicker within the context of a consistent overall planning framework. Turning to the next slide, and the third specific topic uh, we wanted to touch on this morning relates to connecting to the electricity network. And one of the key roles we play in the market is, is to enable all users of the electricity network to connect, whether that's new housing development, new industrial development, or indeed low carbon technologies, or new renewable generation. While much has been achieved over the last decade, and we have succeeded in, in connecting renewables to the extent that 48 per cent of our electricity now comes from renewable sources, we believe there are challenges ahead, both in relation to the cost of connecting to the network and in providing the capacity in a, in a timely way. To deal first with, with the issue of costs, the cost of connecting to the electricity network in Northern Ireland is typically much higher than for a, typical, for a similar project in Great Britain or in Northern Ireland or in the Republic of Ireland. And the reason for that is we take a different policy approach in how we allocate the cost of connecting as between the party looking for the connection and the wider body of consumers. In GB and in the Republic of Ireland, the wider body of consumers through the electricity bills take a greater proportion of the connection costs. Here in Northern Ireland, the connecting party pays all of the connection costs and therefore the, the, the upfront cost is, is much higher. You can make a strong argument for either way, but we believe the fundamental issue here is about the competitiveness of our economy, and we have to level the playing field to change, to change the policy approach to level the playing field so that we can attract investment into Northern Ireland in, in this area. The second area relates to capacity. Like any network, we need to keep continuing investing in the electricity <coughs> network to add capacity so that we can cater for future demand, new development new low-carbon low technologies, um, including some of the very positive projects being proposed by, by TransLink in relation to zero-emission buses and by NI Water in relation to hydrolysis and to produce hydrogen. But we believe there is a need for greater anticipatory investment, where, invest, where we are investing in the, network, in the network ahead of need, <coughs> rather than waiting for somebody to come and knock on our door and say we have a particular project or a particular development we want to do can you provide the network capacity that we would be anticipating those needs and investing in advance. That anticipatory investment would be paid for over 40 years. It would add a marginal cost, but only a marginal cost to electricity bills. But we believe that cost would be more than offset by the economic benefit of lowering or increasing access to the network <coughs> excuse me, by having ready-made capacity there available and lowering the cost of people connecting to the network. It would also enable better planning of the infrastructure and allow us to plan in advance in tandem with other major infrastructure. For example, if there is a new road development, we could maybe take the advantage of running a, a cable underneath that road rather than coming back to dig up the road again year, years later if, if required to meet a specific need. So I appreciate the, the, the specific policy issues relating to connecting to the electricity network do pro probably do not fall within the remit of this committee, but the issue is very relevant 
to the areas that do follow, with particularly transport, roads, development, and the, the water infrastructure. So, in summary, Chair, I suppose the key message we want to present to you this morning is that NIE networks can play a key role in supporting deliver, delivery of critical infrastructure in Northern Ireland, and that infrastructure will, su will support both economic recovery and also progress towards a net zero carbon economy. I am very conscious today the, the Climate Change Commission in the UK is publishing its advice to Northern <coughs> Ireland in terms of where we need to go, and that is in recommending a target of 82 per cent reduction in carbon emissions by 2050, net zero effectively in carbon dioxide, which is the area relevant to energy, so effectively net zero on energy and keeping remaining headroom for agriculture. There is a key interdependency between energy infrastructure and the transport areas, which, and specifically the areas we have touched on around transport and planning. And we very much welcome the committee's interest in these topics and would ask that the, the committee continue to engage on these and look to progress or, or, or progress activity on the policy issues uh, we have outlined this morning. So, happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And can I first of all thank you for the incredibly detailed briefing that you provided in advance of the committee. It is really very welcome and certainly will help us, um, particularly as we move forward with, uh, <coughs> around some of our deliberations around particularly electric vehicle charging. So thank you very much for that. Um, obviously, some, a couple of the barriers really for um, those who wish to, to, um, to purchase um, electric vehicles has been with regards to obviously the cost of the of the vehicle in the first instance, which has been quite high, but also the anxiety around the idea that perhaps you wouldn't get to um, your destination and back with the charge that you had, and, that, and I very much appreciate that technology is is changing, and obviously the um, the mileage that um, some of those vehicles now can do on a, on a charge is much greater than it had been in the past. Um, in your paper, you have highlighted the fact that there are issues with regards to having maybe a patchwork. Um, um, effect if it's done sort of locally, but you need a much more comprehensive and holistic approach to that. Um, your suggestion with regards to a cross departmental government um, EV task force is something obviously which um, which captured, which was quite significant for me. Um, discussions that you've had with the departments, be that infrastructure and economy, how receptive have they been to that type of proposal? Well, I, I think, Chair, the departments, both departments' focus is probably on the energy strategy piece, and I might, I must, might ask Randall to talk specifically about that, but there is a, a transport policy work, work stream within that, um, and I think it is important that departments are focused on that, but that will not deliver an outcome until at least the end of next year, and then probably into 2022 before we get specific action. So our, the sense we want to bring to this debate is, is there is an opportunity to move forward ahead of that. So I believe maybe there is an opportunity to bring the, the stakeholders together in a specific way, either as part of that process or outside of it, uh, to, to, get, to get more urgent action. Maybe Randall might touch specifically on the working of that policy. policy yeah, scheme. The, I mean, you are probably aware of the, the uh, process that the Department for the Economy is following now. With, uh, they've got five thema thematic working groups looking towards pre presenting policy papers. NIE is a member of the transport group, um, and we are working you know, with that group and through that process, obviously, to advise in, into it. I think in terms of you know, the charging infrastructure you know, and, and, and where, where NIE has made an offer, you know, uh, we, we see charging happening in a number of places. You know, obviously, there is the home charger, which will be provided generally by, by the, 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 the domestic user. There is destination charging, which we would look to be provided typically by businesses. You know, and, and, uh, and potentially, you know, shopping areas as well. But it's the bit in the middle. It's the it's the infrastructure en route. It's uh, the public charging infrastructure, very akin to what what the existing infrastructure is there at the minute. But also the rapid charging hubs, and that is a policy that is being followed, particularly in in England, uh, with their project Rapid, and making sure that nobody is within sort of outside 30 miles from a rapid charging hub. Um, and we do welcome the, the the announcement that was made around the Interreg funding. You know, the the, the project for between Scotland, Republic of Ireland, and, and Northern yeah. Ireland to provide 72 charge points, and where you know we, we would see that as a good start to the to the to the process. But you know uh, there there will be a need for more than that. You know within Northern Ireland, and you know we would we would say that um, the, the the current electricity directive, the EU directive, would would say that provision of public char charging is a, a market activity. But at the minute, as as, as Paul had alluded to, there's nobody stepping into that space at the minute. 
you know, we've had a number of inquiries uh, from, from potential operators, but um, you know, they haven't taken up uh, you know, and haven't followed those through. And, and a lot of that is to do with the last topic we talked about, the cost of connection. Um, but there is a place here, and I think you know, the offer that NIE has made is to, to step into that void at the minute um, and, and look to a way either you know, to, to partner with, with, uh, with private sector, if, if, if that's appropriate, or to, to basically, you know, on, a, on a, an instruction or a derogation, to get on with provision of that, and then ultimately we would find a way that uh, we would, we would obviously, um, you know, move that asset on once operators did, you know, enter the space as the, the electric vehicle population starts to increase. So there's there's a number of options that were presented there, and it's just um, at the minute they're on the table, um, and we're willing to engage, you know, uh, with with the department on that, you know, in, in the future. Um, certainly, we, we all have the frustration of, of seeing a road being built, and then in a very short period of time, then obviously utilities move in, then and obviously then they're dug up in order for to to lay tracking um, and, and ducting and so on. And you have made the suggestion that I suppose we should be looking much more collectively uh, and as, as a, uh, across departments um, in order to achieve a much more uh, joined up working approach. Um, there are obviously a number of major um, flagship projects and we're going to be hearing a little bit more of those about those later on today. Um, what discussion have you had with the Department of Infrastructure about working alongside them for those particular schemes around the A5 and the A6? I suppose the, the specific policy changes needed to enable us to play a role in that are more for the Department for the Economy and, and the Utility Regulator, <coughs> because currently we don't have a mandate to invest in advance of need. So if there's a particular road project where we might feel it might make sense to run a, run a, run a cable or run a, at least a duct for a cable underneath that road while it's been constructed, we don't have the wherewithal to do that currently unless we have a very particular need for that cable at, at this point in time. We can't anticipate in future we may need a cable on, on that route. So until there's a change in the, the philosophy underlying how we're regulated around investment, there isn't a meaningful discussion to have with those departments in terms of anticipatory investment. Now, we do engage, obviously, with, with the roads and, and with <coughs> transport and water infrastructure in relation to where we typically need to move or divert uh, existing infrastructure to, to allow for those developments. So we, we would be part of the planning for those projects at that level, but not in the way, not in the way we believe the opportunity is there around anticipating future needs to plan for the future. I suppose what was concerning about that too is that a lot of these projects have been on the long finger for such a, a period of time, you know, particularly in excess of, sort of 10, 15 years before they actually then get to the stage of being developed. And with the absence of that policy, then <coughs> essentially then that, that opportunity is missed. Yeah. That may be something that, that this committee may want to then explore with our own officials um, and consequently then with across, across the department. Uh, I, I think, Chair, the more, we, the more we can join up the planning around the different infrastructure sectors, the better, because cause as particularly as we try to move to a net zero economy, there's huge interdependencies on the different infrastructure sectors, whether it's road, transport, electricity, water and so on. And I think that the role, that's where an infrastructure commission, as recommended uh, recently, could play a very important role in that regard also. And just one last brief question, just in relation to battery storage. Obviously, there are a number of applications now sort of around the country, and those who are living in proximity to it obviously are raising objections. Um, just really a comment from yourself around that and you know, how, how those um, apprehensions could perhaps be, be eased whenever we're speaking to constituents. Yep. Maybe I'll ask Randall to in relation to battery storage. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, at, at battery storage, uh, we would see going forward as as, a, as an important part of the jigsaw and being able to meet our net zero obligations uh, down, down the road. As you're probably aware, there is there is um, there's currently 23,000 you know uh, wind turbines on the network producing renewable power, but they don't always always generate at the time the demand is there. And in some cases, their wind has actually been curtailed off the network because there's no demand. So being able to maximise that and, will, will, and, and, and be able to store uh, energy in the future is, is a key part of that, of that jigsaw. It, at the end of the day, it, you know, a, battery, a battery, you know, in terms of physical uh, appearance, is, is not probably as imposing as a, as a wind turbine would be. Um, and then, you know, so it can be, you know, in terms of physical, be connected, you know, very environmentally, uh, you know, uh, friendly in a friendly way. 
Um, so I would say that you know, it, you know, I would, I would like to hear some specific concerns in relation to battery storage. You know, if they've got particularly technical issues or, or whatever. But I think you know, um, it's, it's a fairly static piece of equipment, um, uh, and it's to me. It is part of the future and part, part of that toolbox uh, for, for the way forward to optimise the use of the network in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation. And it was interesting, Ronald, you mentioned the, the um, charge points there, because I know the East Border Region, which is a corridor group, and they're working with Scotland and the Republic to develop those, and that's a welcome thing in terms of welcome. But see, there's, there's, a, there's a derogation, the EU derogation allowing network operators, you know, to provide uh, charging points? I mean, is that right across the board in terms of European regulation, or is that specific to here? No, that, that's a feature in the EU directive that applies across, right across the right, EU. Right, right across the <coughs> EU, and because that's an important thing. Um, see, in terms of, I just want to get on to the, the issue of, you said, because it's going to be private and public, you know, because you, you're going to have your own route charge, and then also the home, the home charge, and in, in terms of where we are with that, there, I mean, will the home charge be a bigger demand on, on electricity generation per se, or, or how do you see that rolling out? Well, the, the, the studies that we have done into the uptake of electric vehicles would indicate that potentially up to 80% of charging of vehicles will ultimately be done at home, because that can that can um, you know play into other sort of low carbon technologies that people might have in their homes in the future. You know, the likes of, of electric heating through heat pumps, uh, solar panels, even tes you know power walls or, or bat battery storage within own, own homes. So having those combination of technologies allows a customer ultimately to use a car not just as a, a vehicle but also as a, a storage device itself. You know, it's, it's a it's power. So typically, yes, about 80% would probably be at home, but those are going to be lower lower demand. Uh, you know, it'd be more dispersed, uh, more distributed type of demand. You know, across across the network. Whereas, if you take the likes of somewhere en route, like a major, like a filling station forecourt, those would be significant demands, point yeah, demands yeah. on the network, which would require probably, in, in, in a lot of cases, because they're in rural areas, would require significant investment in terms of upgrade to the network to provide the capacity for those rapid chargers. So, so the, the bigger demand obviously is going to be en route, and that's when the more pressure is going to be applied in terms of the network itself. In terms of point load on the network, yes, we would we would envisage <coughs> that, uh, and then some of the applications we've had to date. You know, potentially the connection cost has been prohibitive because of the size of the upgrade that would be required for the connection of the infrastructure required for those those high, uh, those high speed uh, rapid chargers. So in, in, in old money, Randall, <coughs> yep. the dial is only what 300 mile long by about 170 mile wide. I mean, if you take what the chair is just after saying that the technology now, I mean, um, in terms of, and I want to come on to the interconnector in, in a minute because it happens to be in my constituency. But, but in terms of where we are now with the network, and bear in mind what I've just said, because it's not a it's not a big it's not a big landmass mm -hmm. in terms of what. Um, where is the network and providing now for that? There can it meet the demand at the minute. The network, the network for electric it, vehicle charging. It, literally to meet the demand of you know, like I said, if 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 we are looking at the number of electricity points or EV points at the minute, how can that can it be met at the minute in terms of yeah. the network? Probably two things. Uh, if we take if we take the rapid charging hubs, yeah. that's one area where you know it will depend. The, 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 op, the optimum connecting point will depend geographically uh, exactly yeah. where that would be located. Uh, you know things like is there capacity on the network, how close the network is to the point of connection, etc. So what what we would like to do is to work with the likes of, in terms of siting of these uh, chargers, would be to work closely with the likes of the councils, uh, if, if if that if that's where that decision is being made. Uh, to, to be more strategic in terms of where, where potentially the, the connection could be made to the grid so that we're minimising the cost potentially to connectees. So that could be done, but it would be a case-by-case -case basis we'd need, to, we'd need to look at. Some of the applications we've had at the minute, as I said, are in particularly remote rural locations, and they would have required some significant upgrade to the network. You know, um, and and the, the, the costs of that at the minute have been prohibitive. So we would we would like to, again to work closely with councils and with with potential installers to try to optimise the locations of those of those installations. And that that should inform, sorry, the, the local development plan that's taking place at the exactly. minute. Yeah. And just a final point. I mean, because you, you mentioned community consultation, and and I want to just mention the north south interconnector because I know the decisions have been made. Um, 
I know there's six and a half thousand objections. It's in my own area, per se. Um, just your views on now. There's a, there's a connection between Meath and Kildare now, and on, on as part of that uh, preparation or part of that plan, there is an underground suggestion uh, alternative to it. I mean, I'm just wondering, in your view only. I mean, why was there not or any alternatives in terms of underground for the north south one? If you'd like to. Well, uh, firstly, I'm not familiar with the, the, the was it Mead and Kildare you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> not familiar with that specific project. Obviously, it, it's it's in the, it's in the Republic. Um, the, the planning and the design of the north-south interconnector ultimately is 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 a matter for Sony. But, uh, <coughs> there's been several independent studies done both north and south uh, to look at the option of undergrounding or other options around north-south, and all of those concluded that the to underground it. There would be technical challenges, but also it would be at least a multiple of three times the cost, and that the optimal decision was the overground interconnector as, as proposed. So no, that's, that's no. I'd like to say it's just in the grounds you mentioned, because you want to need community buy-in for all of this. And I mean that's a key element. To, you know, the earlier you get talking to the communities, the earlier you know, rather than use a big stick approach to say we need this. Yeah. You know, you need participation from the community. You know. Oh, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, and I think you know for for, for that will be a significant challenge. You know, going forward, especially if we're starting to talk about the uh, you know the renewable targets coming forward, mm. the uptake of low carbon technologies as well. You know, from a demand side as well. I think you know um, there, there's going to be a significant amount of infrastructure investment required over the next 10 to 20 years. So I think you know we, we do need to make progress, you know, and in particular the planning area itself is quite sensitive, yeah. and, and particularly in relation to community support as well, and, and you know, um, we're, we're committed to engaging, you know, uh, with, with communities on any of the infrastructure developments that we're planning to undertake. Okay. I, I think, if I might add, uh, it, it, it highlights the need for an overall debate and, and a joined-up strategy around planning process, and as a society, what, what standards do we want, or what, and how are we going to deliver the decarbonisation of this society and how we're going to roll out infrastructure. We could decide as a society to set a very high bar for the standards, but that's going to mean it's more expensive. Or we could go very low standards to go for the cheapest option, or we find the right balance in between. But I think we need a joined up policy and, and strategic discussion around that that's not about any specific project, but sets the overall framework in which specific projects can then progress. Um, because the, the North South Interconnector has been in the, in the process for about 15 years at this stage. And I'll just say, finally, this chair, I mean, early engagement, like I said, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, 15 years, but I know from South Coast of my own area, uh, you know, early participation and engagement with communities is key to uh, delivering any project. Absolutely so, agree, agree on that, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, Randall Paul, thank you very much for your, your uh, briefing so far. I want to just talk briefly or ask a few points on connection costs and increased capacity. Mr. Bowman had spoken on it there. Currently in Northern Ireland, if, if a business or company has a, I'm going to use some 800 kVA supply, for example, and they want to increase to 1,200 or an increase in capacity, and does that okay, business pay for both voltages? So say it's a 415 volt supply and fed by an 11,000 line, does he or that business pay for both, both those voltages? Or if it's an increase in the 33 line, does he go back, well, I call it a he, go back to that business? You know, how far do they go back in the voltage supply? The current connection Absolutely. charging policy requires the, the connecting customer to be to for any any reinforcement or development at the voltage level they're connected at plus one voltage level up. So for somebody connected at low voltage, yeah. uh, that would mean to the 11 kV network. For somebody who's got a supply at 11 kV, it could mean 33 kV reinforcement cost as well. So it's one voltage level up. That's the current charging. And policy. that customer pays for all that. 100 percent. And does he or she then, uh, under, I presume this is still the maximum demand charge, so let's say he gets an additional 400 kVA, can he secure that supply by paying for the maximum demand on that? Or can another customer you know, on the line tap into the, you know, the infrastructure work he has paid for? At the minute, uh, we're actually due to go to a consultation on that, on that you know, exact issue about whether we go to sort of like a capacity type charging. Yeah. Or whether uh, you know it's based on on what what your application is for. So, at the minute, um, it, it you know if if you create that capacity, yes, that potentially could be available. But we're, we're we are consulting or due to go out to consultation on on a capacity type arrangement, much yeah. to like a broadband, you know, where you you, you actually contract and, and pay for a particular capacity. And it's ultimately yours until you want to. It use will be it. yours, but on, under that, but that is say is, is going out for consultation. Yeah. yeah. 
And, but you referred to in the last point just on the GB model here, you know, in regard to all that. Where does that sit with? Who makes that call? Is that ourselves? Is that the Department of Economy? Is that the regulator? Who makes that call that, that the, the, the business that you're trying to promote in Northern Ireland pays all for it, or it's distributed across you know, the network or, or the, the rest of the customers by some method? Who, who makes that call? Okay, that, that would be probably a call between the utility regulator and the, and the DFE. You know, both, both would probably be involved. Um, you know, we, we would probably you know, uh, raise the issue in relation to that, to that policy change if it was going to be affected with the regulator, but ultimately the DFE would, have, uh, would, would, would be uh, you know, consulted on that also. So it's between the two. And would you refer, sorry, final point, would you refer to consultant or going out to consultation? Who do you consult with? What, what's your, who's your, your range of consultees? Well, the consultation would be, would be public. It would be a public consultation, so really any, anybody would, could, could reply to that. Just as wide as that. As wide, yes. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Ms Kimmins? Thanks, Chair, and, and thank you both um, for your presentation. I have just two questions, really. Um, you recommend that a uh, cross-departmental electric vehicle task force is set up with representatives from um, industry stakeholders. So it was just to see, is that something that is uh, you, it has come from looking at best practice elsewhere, or is that an initiative you have come up with yourselves? Well, I think if you look at how the current electric vehicle charging infrastructure, which was installed about eight years ago, that came out of a collaboration among all those parties with some uh, European funding at the time. So I think the model that delivered the current infrastructure is probably the best starting point uh, and, and to bring those participants back together again is probably the, probably the best starting point to figure out how we take forward the upgrading and extending of that infrastructure, because that infrastructure um, was ahead of its time in 2013 and 2014. It's now behind its time and outdated and needs to be upgraded and extended. And I think the, our view is the best way to do that is to bring the parties who were involved in delivering that initially together. And they are the parties we've outlined in, in the briefing. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's fair enough. Um, and you also said about the Infrastructure Commission um, and how they could play a significant role in facilitating uh, energy strategy targets. Can you expand a wee bit more on that as well, and on on how that role, their role, would be beneficial to it? Well, I, I, I think an infrastructure commission that's looking across all the different uh, vectors of infrastructure can, I suppose, firstly take a, very, a longer term perspective. Um, beyond the, the remit of any assembly or, or beyond the, the planning horizon of a, a particular regulatory price control that, that we might be operating within. They can take a 20 or 30 or 40 year view and they can also look across the different sectors. For example, we're talking about electric vehicles and the decarbonisation of transport, but to take fossil fuels out of transport in Northern Ireland requires a lot of investment on the electricity infrastructure. So unless that thinking is joined up and you don't have transport policy over here and an energy policy over here. You need so, at some level to bring them all together. And we believe that's the key role that Infrastructure Commission could play in providing advice, not just specifically to the Minister for Infrastructure, but also to the overall executive. Well, that's fair enough. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hildage, Deputy Chair. Thanks, thanks Chair. Uh, obviously, it's the connection costs are detrimental uh, going forward. Uh, nobody seems to be stepping up at this stage. What, what would that look like, or what would it mean to the wider electricity base? Would have an increase on the bills, or if you've looked at anything as detailed as that at this stage? Or? Um, I suppose it depends on how far you go with the policy, but it would mean uh, you would certainly be talking about a, f a fraction of one percent. So probably we've calculated that an extra hundred million investment, for example, in the electricity network paid for by the general body of consumers over 40 years would add about 0.5 per cent to a residential bill and 0.1 per cent to a large energy user. Now, 100 million would probably cover the additional connection costs for a number of years. So you're talking about fractions of 1 per cent impact on, on end user prices. Thanks, uh, just from the Chair's point on the environmental issues in relation to battery storage, but some people have approached myself with also query health issues. Have you, have you would respond to those? I think, um, I mean, obviously, uh, 
battery storage would not be something that NIE networks would own. You know, battery storage would come from a private developer. You know, um, we we're again not permitted to to own battery infrastructure under the current current rules. So, I mean, the, the, the responsibility for NIE would be to provide the connection for for the battery. You know, so um, in particular, we, we would we would just be, um, you know, obviously, the, the, you know, we, we would be. A, a, Responsible for that that connection to the, to whatever the bat, wherever the battery is located, but we wouldn't probably have very much dictate over where that's that, that's located, you know, and the type of installation that it's. Right, these new technologies and they're always the first thing that comes into their head is yeah. health issues and stuff like that. But it'd be pretty safe. And I would uh, yes, absolutely. I would suspect so. Because, um, yeah. And, and just on a more specific issue in relation to our own constituency of East Antrim, there, uh, the EPUKI the root site, Bose Green Energy part. That have you had a look at that? Have you had a look to see how that would sort of potentially complement or integrate any of your plans? Uh, I haven't personally been specifically involved in that. Um, I mean, I'm aware that you know, obviously at Carut, you know, that there are there. Are con uh, options been considered in terms of how that's going to be powered in the future. You know, potentially using using lower carbon type type fuels. But um, you know, we would we would be you know obviously supportive of any move that moves towards a greener type of uh, of fueling. It's quite a proposal out at the minute now. If you do get a chance to look at the situation, you could help yourselves out as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. Happy to have a look at it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, um, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you for your. Presentation and the um, it was one of the slides which was the plan decision timelines and there was a comparison with Northern Ireland with England Scotland and the public plan was particularly useful um, because it gives us a real understanding of the challenges that are here and I just wanted to see from your perspective what do you see are the particular issues that are going to need to be changed to, to make the plan process much better because there's also a review of the plan act underway which will be completed. At the end of March, but it's important that we, we feed into this because um, there's lots of um, sort of targets and objectives being set in terms of what you're trying to meet, but the planning system isn't, doesn't seem to be delivering with that. And the other sort of question, because I know we're stuck with time, from the local council's development plans and how they're including you within their consultations. And I would declare I was formerly a member of Ards and North Down Borough Council. Okay, um, I suppose in, in terms of that the changes we might anticipate would help the planning process. I think we, we've I highlighted some points in the, in the slide and, in, and, and on the briefing paper, but certainly we don't feel there's enough accountability for the timescales currently. Um, as we've outlined, the current target is 30 weeks, but the average is taking 53 weeks. So that's suggesting we're not even meeting our own targets. So if, if there was accountability in the process to work to the current targets, that would be a significant improvement in its own right. Um, but we do believe there is a need for a greater strategic direction that aligns both the local level decision making and the overall national level decision making. and That, that needs to come from an overarching strategic planning framework uh, which, which sets the context. And Also, it is important there is an alignment of uh, a responsibility for the planning process and decisions with responsibility for delivering on, on clean energy infrastructure targets. So, If lo local councils are making planning decisions, local councils should also have responsibility for ensuring delivery of, of clean energy targets in, in, in their areas, so there is an alignment and they can make their choices within that. In term Sorry, go ahead, then. I was maybe just going to add that maybe in terms of the overall process, one area that we probably would see that uh, you know, might, might be worth looking at would be the, the statutory consultee part of that process. I think you know, the, tar the timeline within that is around 21 days for, for response from statutory consultees, and that is probably one area that we would see as, as you know, particularly maybe not being met in our experience in relation to things like cluster developments and, and, and things like that. So, yeah. Just one last question. Northern Ireland Water are looking at towards the hydrogen production. I just want to see your view around that, because obviously Northern Ireland Water is a utility for um, clean water and for wastewater, and whether how that fits in terms of energy production, in terms of them diversifying into that. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a welcome development. I mean, the green hydrogen um, ultimately comes from it's produced from electrolysis, which is a process that uses electricity, which should come from green renewable electricity. So we have a great opportunity here in Northern Ireland, given the abundance of wind energy, both offshore and onshore. 
to use that to become a, a hub for the production of green hydrogen. And we, we feel that's beneficial to the overall energy system because, as Randall made a point earlier, um, sometimes there's more wind energy available than we can use in the system. So if that surplus renewable energy is used to produce green hydrogen, which can be used in, in specific sectors, maybe that's difficult to, to provide an electric solutions such as heavy goods transport or shipping. Um, I think there's an opportunity there. And NI Water have a very specific need for oxygen in, in, in the wastewater treatment process. So I think it makes absolutely makes sense, makes sense for them to pursue that strategy. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Uh, Gumi Algot, both for your, uh, for your presentations and also for the information that you sent on. And I think, Chair, if there was a demonstration of a lack of joint up government, we have seen that here today. Because when you are talking about spatial planning and planning and transport and energy and nothing is aligned. So I just want to pick up on the point of um, what the Chair had asked around the A5 and the A6. Obviously, the A6 is on the way, the A5 has not started, and hopefully, it does start soon. But the docket you're talking about underneath the road, surely we want that done now if we're going to build back better and not have a situation where we had, for instance, with the last plan and application because it came in overhead. So surely we need to find a way of having that alignment uh, taking place so that the dock is underneath the road, particularly in the A5. So have you been engaging, even though you're, you're saying it's not actually yourselves that can make that decision. You need the support of the regulator, you need the support of the Department of Economy and obviously the support of the Department of Infrastructure as well. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're certainly engaged on the specific projects in relation to the implications for the current in electricity network infrastructure if we need to divert or alter the network to cater for road development. Um, but we, the, the specific change I think we need, and I agree it's our, there is urgency around this uh, mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it's a putting a break on economic development uh, currently. The specific change is a remit for us to invest in the electricity network, anticipating future need rather than based on need that's here in front of us today. And that's a change that needs to come from, I suppose, the policy signal needs to come from the Department for the Economy and the specific change that needs to come from the utility regulator. And, and we're engaging with both. But um, I think the more active uh, engagement uh, across across policy making generally on, on that issue, the better to give it focus and attention. Well, if we're talking about building back better and a green economy, and a lot of ministers talk that language and articulate um, those kind of words when they're, when they're explaining what they want to do in the future, so we need to be actually seeing some meat on the bones. Can I ask you about large-scale renewable capacity, because obviously that is needed, but we also need to incentivise some more small-scale renewable um, generation and upscale uh, community energy projects. So what work is going on with yourselves, for instance, in the communities? Because I'm quite conscious of what you said about the need to engage communities and make sure that nothing's done without them. So um, particularly around upscaling uh, community small-scale energy projects. Yeah, I suppose our, our role, and, and Randall might comment on this one more specifically, but our role is to connect or provide a connection to, to all energy projects, uh, all, whether they're community driven, large scale, private, public, whatever. Um, we, our role is to make sure we have an electricity network that can cater for all demand. Um, certainly from a philosophical point of view, we would be supportive of community energy projects. I think there, there's a significant role they can play uh, in the market. Um, if, you think, if you look at, certainly in the Republic of Ireland and Maybe in GB, to a lesser extent, community projects play a much greater role than they do, than they do here currently, because they're they're incentivised um, through local council supports and so on. Um, so I, I think it's important that we encourage active participation in the energy market through communities. Um, but we need to find the right policy measures to make sure that that works in practice. And it's not necessarily about having greater subsidies for smaller scale. Because that, that can lead to suboptimal decisions as well, but ensuring communities can have can have equal access and participate in, in projects. Uh, I know in the Republic there's a provision for communities to take a, potentially take an ownership stake in, in, in wind projects in, in, in their region, um, or to have some form of stake in the project. And I think that's a model would be worth looking at as well. Can I ask just one supplementary to that? So, my reading, hearing you right, that without the further incentivisation as you're talking about, that that's going to have an impact on whether we can decarbonise our uh, our electricity in terms of generating the um, electricity. I, th I think there's a role for community projects uh, in the overall decarbonisation, but ultimately. 
to really make a difference, you need big projects of big scale project, as well. So yeah, a community yeah, solution, a community driven model alone won't solve no, the problem. No, of course, I'm uh, conscious of that. There's a role for community projects, but. But I it's the incentivisation of all of that that's needed, whether it's big projects or small it, projects. It, there needs to be a, 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 well, incentivisation. Um, I suppose it needs to be incentivised through the, to the, to the overall policy framework. Uh, sometimes incentivisation can be interpreted as subsidies, yeah. and I think, mm -hmm. I think going forward, we need to find a way to decarbonise energy without a dependency on subsidies, and that's about Northern Ireland being open for business and being competitive in, in things like the planning process and things like access to the electricity network and the cost of connections, whether it's community level or larger scale, uh, and then they're the issues we're, we're, we're talking about. Do you know if you want to add yeah. more specifically? No, I agree. I think, I think you know, uh, we, we do have uh, quite, quite a significant in, you know, customer engagement uh, programme. Uh, we, we've, we've got an engagement panel which uh, consists of the utility regulator, NIE, and the, the DFE, you know, and we, we, we've got a, a programme of, of engagement through that, and also independently through, through our own stakeholder engagement uh, plans. Um, but as Paul said, you know, the, the engagement would be made an, a lot easier and a lot simpler for us if we were able to knock some of these hurdles down that were pre presented today. If we were able to say that you know, we have an effective planning process, we have got uh, you know, uh, more uh, sort of aligned you know, connection cost mechanism to GB and ROI where we don't become a disincentive to investment. You know, we, we, because at the minute we are driving people to those other locations, mm -hmm. uh, that would make that process a lot easier for us to have that engagement and, yeah. and be able to say, look, you know, we are starting to solve some of these issues that are in the way, standing in the way. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Beggs. Uh, <coughs> earlier, you'd indicated that there is a disparity of the amount of um, connection uh, linkages uh, and charges um, between Northern Ireland and GB and, and dare say, the Republic. Can you indicate what proportion of costs are charged elsewhere and, and what, the, what how it does compare, how we do compare with that? Okay, in, in, in GB, typically um, the method of connection charging is based on the amount of capacity that the connecting customer utilises from a, from a reinforcement. So, for example, if a, if a reinforcement f for a con particular connection created 10 megawatts of capacity, but the customer only needed five, they get charged accordingly, a, a proportion, so it's like an apportionment cost. Um, in the Republic of Ireland, it's, it's probably more akin to where we were pre-2012, where there was a fixed proportion of the total cost of connection was uh, socialised through the electricity bill. So, um, we, we, if you remember back in 2000, and before 2012, there was a 60-40 split, 60% uh, paid by the connectee and 40% socialised through, the, through the, the general customer bill. Um, that's, that's a similar sort of process that there is in the Republic of Ireland, which I think is about 50% socialised. So it's, it's, there is, the, the concept is that a proportion of the cost, two slightly different mechanisms, but a proportion of the cost is actually socialised. We're, we're currently in Northern Ireland 100%, up to the next voltage level, is, is paid by the, the customer, the connectee. In, in uh, designing your overall network, it must be uh, hugely complex in, in uh, trying to work out um, future uh, renewable energy generation, where, where it might go uh, and what infrastructure would be required. But equally, I understand the highest electricity load is normally on a still winter's day when there's no wind and there's a heavy frost. Um, so, with, with the closure of some larger plants, such as the route being, being earmarked um, in terms of the scale of coal generation, what alternative generation is being put in place to ensure that the lights stay on? Yeah. I think the, 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 you're quite right. There, there's, there's, there's nearly around about 1,800 megawatts of renewable power connected to Northern Ireland, and that would equate to the maximum demand on a cold day. So there is the, 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 certainly the significant amount of, of renewables, but you, you know, you're right that there are times when the wind isn't blowing you know, um, to, to meet that. And on the converse, there's times when the wind is blowing when the demand isn't there, like the, the middle of the night. Um, there is a requirement you know, for us to continue to have a certain amount of synchronous um, you know, um, generation in the network for stability, and that would be come from typically from our existing three large power stations, you know, the likes of Kilroot, Valley Lumford and Kilkira. Um, but they're, they're, you know, the, the alternatives probably are looking at are that in, in generation, you know, there is still a, 
a number of options there you know to keep that type of plant on on the grid it could be through continued use of gas in the short term you know to uh, maybe offset by carbon capture um, but ultimately it could look towards using some of the hydrogen that's produced to, as a fuel for, for generation you know of, of that type of type of plant you know into the, into the future so um, you know I think uh, there certainly is a number of options there, and I think obviously it will depend on cost. You know, in terms of which are the most attractive, uh, you know, options as we head towards that 2050 target. And in terms of um, <coughs> alternative power sources to, to supply the system when wind is, is not available, how do you plan the infrastructure required to facilitate? Uh, whatever alternative sources coming through. That, that's that's a difficult you know one, um, and I think you know what what we want to, to continue to do is talk to talk to people who are in that development field. Obviously, <coughs> and I use the bit in the middle where the wires business, you know, where the, the piece between the generation and, and the customer, and and where our, our role is to facilitate and enable the connection of of, the, of that type of resource. Um, a key decision for us, you know, going forward is probably you know this discussion around offshore wind as well, you know, and in terms of. Whether we would want to have a, a significant, um, you know, offshore wind development, which could take, you know, an excess of 350, 400 megawatts upwards of power, um, which would replace the requirement to have it more dispersed and distributed on the network, you know, at a, at a, at a lower voltage level. So that that type of connection um, is is probably attractive in that it can have less environmental impact, you know, in terms of onshore because uh, you're not having the the plethora of smaller scale generation. For the same, um, you know, uh, value of of, of uh, supply, um, and it, it only requires, for instance, a single connection onto the transmission grid, as opposed to multiple connections onto distribution. So, you know, we we just need to keep close to to the the, the, um, the development proposals in generation and ensure that we're 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 strengthening the grid ahead of the of those of those needs. Um, but it is a, it is a balance, and that's where we were talking about having anticipatory investment. Um, one of the things that's worked well for us, you know, in, in hitting the, the, the 20, 2020 target of the 40% was the adoption of what we call clusters um, in certain <coughs> parts of Northern Ireland, where we create a hub for the connection of multiple wind farms, and that has that's a sort of anticipatory investment that minimises the amount of infrastructure, electricity infrastructure required for connection of that of that type of type of um, of generation. So that that's, that's worked well in the past. But what we would say is it, it would probably has a role in the future of trying to create those hubs where we can connect centres of, of, of generation. Um, but we would look to have a more strategic type of approach to how that's developed, you know, a more integrated approach with developers and with councils so that we can plan and deliver that infrastructure ahead of need more effectively rather than being more reactive, um, sort of more developer-led as it has been over the past 10, ten years. So I think if we become more plan-led, more integrated, more strategic, and involving the, you know, the various um, bodies that are required, including local councils um, and developers, that we can, we can optimise that development more, more effectively you know, in the future. <coughs> you talked about a developer-led uh, grid at present almost. Yep. Um, how, how stable, how resilient do you think the current grid is? The grid, the grid is stable. The grid is resilient, um, and you know the, we, we've talked again about you know uh, sort of the, 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 there still is you know uh, there still is what we would call business as usual investment required on the grid uh, for for um, the likes of just normal wear and tear asset replacement and also for for general reinforcement and that work still needs to go ahead. Um, but there there is a, a you know we, we see a significant probably. More investment required towards the transmission part of the network, um, you know, going forward, to ensure that those renewable targets are going to be met in the future. But at the minute, yes, the, I mean, the grid, the grid is, is resilient, um, and and we continue to invest to ensure that you know it, it, it stays, you know, you know, a safe and efficient grid. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, no one else.
has indicated. Um, can I thank you both for um, your presentation and your briefing? Um, it was incredibly useful and I think um, very timely too. Um, and there are a number of issues within that I think that we can follow up as a committee and certainly engage with um, other committees on um, and to see some progress. So thank you very much for the opportunity to have the conversation and certainly We'll come back to you again, um, perhaps even via research, in relation yes, to any future work that we do. So thank you very much. Thank you. thank you, Chair, and happy to engage in, in whatever way appropriate going forward on these issues. Okay, thank, thank, you, thank, thank you very, thank you very much. much. Thank you. We may want to pick up some of what was said at our, in our next briefing, but I think there's, there's certainly something in relation to um, the EU directive that we may want to yeah. raise with the economy yeah, um, yeah. around whether or not that's been transposed into Northern Ireland law. Um, and also maybe get some more information from um, the Minister around the interreg funding. Yes. Um, I, I know, Chair, well. just through one of the, it's one of the board the Carter groups. There's three of them there, and I know that they have got funding in interreg to to develop that, and that's a good thing. But I think I would also be mindful of the, of what the comments that they made with regard to having like, like a patch, patchwork approach yeah. to this, as opposed to a holistic approach. So I suppose we, if we have, if we can get some information around where they are in that project, yes. and then how we're going to look at it sort of on a broader scale across Northern Ireland. Well, Chair, the, just through the, the question you asked with the FA, I mean, there should have been a plan outlined now within local development area plans. Where, where those should be, you know, if you know, if you plan that, you know, they they should know already that discussion should be taking place. But I do see it's definitely cross departmental because the economy has a big part to play in this here. It's not just to. Well, we, we will return to this when yeah. um, certainly um, in the new year, and we'll have research come to speak to us as well. So it means then we can then take this to the next the next um, stage. Okay, anything else with regards to that briefing anyone wants to highlight at this stage or are you content to move? Sure, just on the permitted development, sorry. Because it's, it's important. Because what we're saying, I know the question was asked to Mr Muir about the planning process. Permitted development allows most of this now to, through local council. They have a big part to play. See, that was concluded with us today. Mrs Kelly? <coughs> Chair, I was just wondering... <coughs> On the local authority bit, you know, because I know that some local councils are investing in, and I just wonder how they're being linked in to the overall network picture. It might be useful yeah. to do like a, a mapping exercise if that were possible and see what investment they're bringing forward alongside their town centre management. Uh, well, I think research are now doing a piece of work <laughs> gathering up some information. Okay. Well, okay, moving on. Turn the electric off in here, it's cold. I know it's freezing. They <laughs> <laughs> turned it off. They <laughs> turned it off. Have you looked around and you can hang beef in it's here, Chair? It's not cold. Really you can hang beef. It's in order, it's in order to move <laughs> us on quickly. Yes. Get us out of here. Freezes. There's a method in the madness. Okay, moving then to our next session, which is departmental briefing on roads procurement and major projects. Our briefing paper is at page 304. Ansard uh, will record the meeting. I'm going to welcome John Irvine, who's the Director of Major Projects and Procurement, and also Philip Hamilton, who is Strategic Road Improvements and Procurement. Um, gentlemen, you're both very welcome to our, our meeting this afternoon, and apologies for the delay, as you'll appreciate. Um, it's very difficult for this committee to keep to time, um, but we did have two previous briefings, um, which did, um, the first one went on um, considerably longer than probably we had anticipated. Um, so apologies for the delay. Um, if you're content, we could maybe just go straight to questions. If you want to make a very very short. Um, no, no, just uh, I, I was up at the committee at the end of June for a briefing on major projects and procurement, and this is essentially an update. We've given you a paper. So, uh, my colleague Philip Hamblin is with me this time, so uh, we're happy to go straight to questions. Okay, thank you very much for that, and I appreciate that um, greatly. Um, I'm not sure whether you heard um, from our previous witnesses in relation to um, the suggestions which they were making, particularly around it. This was much more strategic approach to obviously planning and working alongside energy. And obviously, the EFI has a, a critical role in all of that. And as we're discussing major projects, be that A5, A6, that it would make sense 
we were going to apply a common sense approach to these things, that perhaps um, that we did look um, much more collectively about how uh, we look at major projects such as what you're doing and that you know, we do future-proof those projects. I'm really looking for a comment from you around that. Yeah, so I listened carefully to, to what the guys were saying in the previous um, presentation. So in terms of us, the development of major projects, we do work very closely with all the utilities to facilitate, if you like, the now. Right? But the point that the, um, the previous speakers were making that uh, you, you know, if you take a major road scheme uh, to future proof it from their perspective, if they wanted to delay a cable, uh, you know that that ultimately would need cover from you know the Department for the Economy for policy and for the utility right from the utility regulator because that's a cost that then would be transferred to back the customer. So there's a, obviously the, the point they were making was there's a conversation to be had here. I think from our perspective as the developers of major roads, it, it's. For it would be reasonably straightforward to facilitate this, mm -hmm. so we'd be happy to work with people. But we actually, we, we'd be a player in this rather than than the driver. I think is the best way of putting that. Yeah, and, and while I appreciate that, I suppose somebody has to kind of move with it too. And ultimately, at the end of the at the end of this, um, as the as the owner of the asset at the end where you're then receiving requests from a, a regulator to come in, a utility to come in and disturb that asset. You know, it's never it never goes back to its original condition, which is the, the challenge that we always ha we have in, in many of our, our roads and our footpaths. Yeah, so um so in terms of, of future proofing a new asset, I, th I think the, the point is there has to be a conversation around there. Uh, in terms of you know, the current assets and, and digging up um, uh, uh, footways to put in um, uh, new utilities, there is a process for that on the street works order, and uh, you know all the utilities and the department try and work together. So I think there are two slightly separate issues, um, but the, the more strategic point I think needs to be you know. The, the, a wider conversation between departments and the utility regulator in relation to energy mm -hmm. and maybe the water regulator in relation to, to water. And you know, you'll be aware that the minister ha in, the, in the summer um, engaged a, an advisory panel to look at an, an infrastructure commission. And um, you know, you know, that, that's maybe you're getting into the, the area of strategic conversations there, depending on, on what she decides on the way forward in that. Um, so I, th I think this is about conversations and trying to do the right thing, uh, but it has to be done with the, with the right policy cover, I think. No, and I absolutely appreciate that, but I think I suppose because we are in a situation where we've waited so long for a number of schemes to, to start, and obviously um, this is now a side to that, it would still be useful, if possible, in order to try to progress that type of policy. Um, so that, you know the likes of you know, particularly sort of A5, A6 could be included in that, but uh, yeah. of course these things don't happen overnight, and I very much appreciate that. Yeah, but I imagine you know uh, in terms of where you know the development of these, it's probably fairly um, straightforward to uh, amend the design to get a, a cable or a pipe in, in the road if there was some you know agreement on a, on, on on the policy direction for this. I, I think. Okay. Um, and I also appreciate that um, much of your paper really, um, there have probably been a number of members around the table who the things would fall into their constituency, so we probably are going to end up becoming very parochial on this one. Um, uh, can I just receive some more information just with regards to the development programme, which includes the likes of the A24 Ballon Hinge Bypass and others? Those are actually quite light, obviously, on detail. Yeah. It was just whether or not you could give us um, an update on where some of those schemes are rather than the, the, the much larger schemes. No, that, that's fine, and it was just for brevity. Rather, you know, so in terms of um, Ballon Hinge Bypass, um, so... Uh, there was a public inquiry into that scheme some time ago, and the previous minister announced his notice of intention to proceed with the scheme, uh, which is essentially the completion of the uh, inquiry process and the, and the environmental go-ahead for the scheme. But w when the assembly fell, uh, sorry, the next stage of the process is a direction order, uh, which essentially uh, copper fastens the, the planning permission and inverted commas for the scheme. So uh, it wasn't able to be made. Uh, when the assembly fell, the minister has now 
asked officials to um, uh, you know, bring forward a proposal that she can consider to now make the direction order. So that's where that sits. So it's a well-developed scheme. Uh, uh, and once, uh, you know, if the minister determines that uh, decides he wants to make the direction order, that's the statutory process is complete, and that would be uh, you know, ready uh, to move to the next stage, which would be uh, procurement. But that would also be dependent on her priorities and clearly uh, within the, the the funding available to her and other priorities across the department. So there isn't such a time scale in relation to that it's very much regarding the minister's priorities as opposed to anything outside of that? <coughs> so, in terms of the direction order, I, th I think probably we'd be in a position to give her advice on that fairly soon in the new year, Philip, I think. Uh, yes, I think it would be by, by March time. Uh, the Minister should be in a position to do that. Right. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that feeds into the Minister's priorities in those decisions would, would be the fact that we're stuck in a, a one-year budget cycle. And that doesn't isn't particularly helpful in terms of planning for schemes that take six years in development and two or three years to construct. Thank you. Um, and obviously, the, the the park and ride schemes there was there was funding made available um, to progress some of those. And we have a list there: Newton Arts, Cumber, Cairns Hill, Downpatrick, and Troopers Lane. And they will all be at various stages within the process. Yeah. Um, could you maybe just give us an, an overview of what that funding allows those projects to do? So, uh, so that at the early stages, so it will enable the department uh, to uh, acquire land for um, Newton Arts. Uh, Probably Cumber, Down Patrick, uh, and Cairns Hill, uh, and in terms of Troopers Lane, it's been taken forward by Translink, and it's more advanced. They have the the land, and and, and I think it, it will be much further down the excuse the pond the track uh, to uh, to get to move that to um, uh, construction now. I, I could probably get you more up to date details on that if, if we can come back oh, to you on that. That would be really useful. Yeah. So essentially, the, the four million that was allocated in June, uh, you know, kicks the process off, uh, and then once you've got the land, then you move into uh, the development of the scheme, planning permission, and eventually, you know, construction. Uh, okay. Um, an another um, project which is it's not on your list. Um is obviously um, a, a sort of a bugbear for those who are, are, are in and around the city would be um, around the, the harbour and Titanic um, with sort of traffic issues and so on. And I was just curious whether or not there were any discussions with the harbour in relation to any sort of longer term project there. So I, I'm going to have to come back to you on that one. I, I suspect our divisional colleagues may have had some discussions around. Um, uh, now, as I recall, uh, in relation to the harbour, there may be a planning condition uh, and, uh, about the, the development that links to the construction of a junction on the A2, um, and there there may have been or may be discussions ongoing about that. But I, I unfortunately, I don't know the details of that. But we could come back to you on that. Is that okay? Thank you, um, Mr. Heldage. Thanks, Chair. And I'll go on to my usual hobby horse of the uh, <laughs> York Gate Interchange, York, York Street Interchange. Um, thanks for reminding us it was June and you it was sometime around that, but I wasn't sure you were here the last time yep. you gave an update. You were aware of the, the JR and the outcomes of that. Uh, on June, you told me that there had been a review going on from September 19, and I sort of said, you. Yeah, what are they reviewing over that period of time? That seems like forever. You've now indicated that there is a. Uh, the minister has asked for a short review of the process, a short, sharp assurance review of the scheme. And that was over the summertime, and now we're six months down the line. And could you tell us anything at all in the positive nature as to what may be happening at that particular scheme? Okay, so back in the back in June, I indicated we were doing the review of procurement strategy because the the previous procurement was challenged, and uh, uh, the, the decision to award the contract fell as a result of that. So we we thought it was good practice to review that. That has actually now been completed. Um, Goodness for that, for that was September 19. Okay, so um, 
Obviously, in, in the, uh, you know, we, new ministers came in in January this year, uh, and in, in the summer, so it was, it was after I came to the committee at the end of June, uh, the, the minister asked for a short assurance review of the, the whole project. So, obviously, new minister uh, wanted to look at the scheme in the round uh, against her her priorities. So, you know, things like living places, creating livable places, uh, walking, cycling, climate change, those sorts of issues. So, she commissioned that review. It was a short, short review. It has been completed, and the minister is now considering, you know, its findings uh, before deciding on the next steps. So that, that's where that sits at the minute. That, that, that's good to get an update. Um, I wouldn't be one to criticise the minister, but there are others whispering in my ear about it. it is the minister's constituency, you know. So hopefully she looks up. Anything further? No. Okay, um, Miss Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, uh, John and Philip. Um, just a couple of questions there. One obviously is one that that I kept raising quite a lot. It was just to see, I know we're, we're still waiting on a decision in terms of the inspector's report, um, but if if that is a positive decision, do we have any timeline for um, construction to start? I have asked the Minister today, I haven't had anything um, concrete, but even just to get an idea, I'm just so conscious that nearly on a weekly basis there's, all, there's another collision or unfortunately there was a fatality in the last few weeks. Okay, so... Um... Uh, just to say that the minister is very focused on the A1 junctions uh, project, uh, and, and she's she's made that very clear on a number of occasions in in, in the house and in answers to uh, various correspondents. So the public inquiry has been completed, as you know probably. Um, we have the inspector's report, and the next stage of that is uh, the department's response to that. So officials have to go through the report, and then. Uh, uh, come back to the minister, so the minister can then uh, make a consider making a decision on the next stage. So we think that will be around the end of January. Um, after that, so essentially, uh, a positive decision would take this to the next stage, um, which would be um, uh, uh, to move a move to procurement, uh, if the minister was minded to do that, uh, and that's where we stand at the minute. Okay, and, and phase two, are there any plans for phase three? You know, in, in terms of looking at additional ways to improve safety on the road. Uh, so, uh, the, the the scheme the, the scheme that went to public inquiry is from Hillsborough South to Loch Brickland. Um, so, the Eastern Division are looking at uh, the A1 from Sprucefield to Hillsborough. In terms of, there's no central barrier there. Uh, and they're looking at uh, a smaller, much smaller scheme uh, to, to deal with that. Uh, and I think then uh, the Loch Brickland South will be looked at as part of the development of the Regional Strategic Network Transport Plan. Uh, uh, and it will be looked at more strategically uh, in that context. And that is due, I think, to be published sort of towards the end of next year. Okay. Okay, no, that's fair enough. Just in terms of the self relief road, uh, John, the last time you were here, I had stressed the, the local um, lobby that you know for it to be a, a lifting bit. Um, and I'd raised, I've raised it probably for every state, every opportunity I can since I've come into the assembly at the start of the year. Um, and I know the minister has re recently met with um, the local council for Nearly Morning Down. It was just to say, you know, are, are we considering designs um, that look like Include a lifting bridge for the Southern Relief Road, um, and you know, is that something that we're, we're taking seriously? Yes. Okay. So, um, ju just to say on that, uh, the, the minister had wanted to meet stakeholders in this, and she gave a, commi a commitment. I think at this committee, maybe back before lockdown, uh, that was all delayed because of COVID. But in the last, I think it was last week actually, she met with uh, local the council and local councillors to talk about this specific issue. Uh, so. We have taken the design forward at this stage on the basis of a fixed bridge, and, uh, but that does not rule out the option of a, an opening bridge, so that, and, and that has always been the Minister's position on this. Uh, uh, and following the meeting last week, uh, officials are, are going away to look at 
uh, you know, the cost issues with this and, and to come back to the Minister on it at a, at a future time. And, and I think also as a result of that meeting, um, uh, Nuri Moore and Down Council may be doing a bit of work on, on the wider tourism benefits uh, uh, related to whether the bridge is, is, is um, opening or, or fixed. Well, it's tourism benefits of an opening bridge, she should really say. So, yes, yeah. the answer to your question is, it, you know, it's nothing's ruled out yet. Yeah, no, that, well, that's good. And I suppose um, good to see things are progressing on it because essentially it would close down a, a part of Newry, you know, and, and the Albert Basin there that were in the process of developing significantly, which would be a huge tourism uh, benefit. So it, it would all complement each other. Just similarly, then, in relation to the Narrow Water Bridge, John, what options are the department looking at with regard to that scheme? So Narrow Water Bridge isn't the scheme that we are actually taking forward in, in, in uh, my directorate, uh, but I can give you a, a little update on that. We have been looking. Uh, the minister has asked us to. Obviously, she has indicated uh, this is this is one of her sort of uh, priorities. It's it's in new decade, new approach, and we've been trying to explore uh, uh, how this could be uh, taken forward. Uh, and we've provided some advice on that, and, and we need to have a discussion. Okay, that's fair enough. Thanks very much, John. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair. John, you're very welcome. And no doubt I'm going to be parochial as well. I mean, you know um, that uh, you mentioned the Mid and South West City Day in your presentation there. Um, I just want to ask because, I mean, those of us who, who we went to Armagh uh, on most occasions. Know that there's serious congestion around it, and um, anything to address those congestion issues would certainly be, be very, very welcome. So, um, I see here you said that there's been exploratory discussions between officials and council officials regarding potential infrastructure projects for inclusion in a future mid and south west city deal. So, I must ask, in terms of those discussions. Has the RMR North West and East <coughs> Link roads been mentioned as part of those discussions? Okay, so um, yes, we have had early discussions, uh, exploratory discussions, uh, on the back of a uh, a publication by the Mid and South West uh, group of councils on their and I can't remember the exact name. It's the Regional Economic Strategy, uh, but that document contains a whole series of road projects. Uh, and Armagh North and West and Armagh East are, are, are in that. So they, they had a whole range of things that they, they obviously want to consider as they uh, you know, kick off the process to develop the deal. So, yes, they, they, they were in the mix. They're definitely on the list, and that will be welcome because, I mean, people have been asking about it for a long time. Anybody who knows it, you know, like I said, I've, I've mentioned the, the congestion. I mean, if you're trying to get through Armagh at a certain time today, it's unbelievable. So. That's certainly welcome. That, that those are on the on the list. So, so just just to be clear, that you know that's you know the, the councils. The, oh no, no, that's, that's their no, list. And, and sort of we will our engagement is you know to work with them to, to help them develop this. No, no appreciate that, and, and I know that they have been on the agenda for a long period of time. Any of those two, especially the North West and the, and the, the East Link. Just want to want another uh, ask another question of me, just in relation to it. I mean, there's a very strong lobby now to extend the link, the real link between Portadown and Armagh. It's been a discussion for a long time by a number of people. Um, and if, if we're serious, actually, about you know, tackling climate and everything else and moving forward and, and changing the way it's how we travel, I mean, was there any discussions in relation to that as part of that discussion with the Mid and South West, uh, a possible link between Portadown and Armagh, a real link? So... Uh I, I think our discussion was mainly focused around roads. I, I imagine that the that sort of a link would be part of the thinking in the development of the regional strategic network transport plan because it will deal with, you know, road, bus, and rail, uh, and, and that would probably feature in, in that document, which, as I said, is likely. I, and that's just, and that was my next question. Just yeah. you know, we update on the reasons. So, uh, so it's been taken forward by another part of the department, and, and the indication is there's a lot of work going on in that at the minute. And towards the back end of next year, I think that will be ready to, you know, the minister will consider that, and then before it would perhaps go to consultation. 
So, you know, again, it, it might be helpful if, if we come back and other, other people in the department take that forward. It's not our team, but we could come back and, and confirm that to you. No, that would certainly welcome. I mean, and, and to just took the opportunity because you're up yep. today because, I mean, it's important to, to the RMR region, Alice. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, John and Philip. And obviously, we're in a tour in Northern Ireland, and we're becoming a cook's town in a wee moment. So just get yourself ready for that. <laughs> but see, in general, what um, Philip, John, with any of these projects, okay, I have a few issues with. I'm not going to get into detail. Obviously, with the A32 Macclesfield bypass, which I finished, and the A6 with landowners, which are generally mainly farmers, and the relationship probably starts, e.g., eight, nine, ten years ago, when a department official says A, B, and C, and that farmer logs that, then. Developments go on, that official moves on, no official comes, maybe no one moves on, and the farmers now at the end of that entire journey, and farmers being farmers, farm land, they don't take notes, they don't do emails, generally, generally. So, and obviously, have a land agent in the middle of all that. How can you make that process better to save your time, my time, and a lot of officials' time going forward with the new projects? Those projects have been and gone and nearly complete, but I'm just saying, is there any learning we could? get from those projects in regard to landowners and that whole process of communication between them? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. I'm, 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 I'm really not over the detail of, of, of our land transactions. You know, the, the, their divisional teams do that. In relation to specifics, if there are specific no, no, landowners, no. Um, I don't know, you can add it. I, I, it's not an area I'm totally familiar with from a strategic point of view, because divisional lands teams do that. But you know, I do appreciate that you know, you're right. It starts a long time ago, and it takes a good you know until you maybe up to six years after the scheme. I think it is before it's all finally signed off. That's the process, Philip. I don't know. It, it is. I mean, it, it's it's an aspect that we are very conscious of taking people's land off them um, to build a road scheme. So it, it's something that that we do try and approach sensitively. Um, obviously, in losing their land, people want, will want compensated for that, um, and the process for that is quite drawn out. Um, people can get 90 per cent compensation uh, at the outset when the land is vested, but some people prefer to wait for the majority of the compensation until the, the scheme is actually completed. Um, so it is something that we are very conscious of, and certainly um, we do try and learn lessons from each scheme that, that we do and look back at it retrospectively to see what we can do better for the next one. In some of the cases, I'm you can see the degree of unfairness between some farmer getting something and another farmer getting another thing. I'm not referring to monetary value. I'm referring to access, where some farmers have their land completely cut off. And, you know, the, there's a, like an agricultural assessment is done to you know, give the Department of Infrastructure some information to say, you know, we should do this or we shouldn't do that. There's an awful lot weighed in one little bit of paper. Some farmers are getting a negative impact on that. Moving on uh, from that point, in regard to the, the five schemes that you have on the, on the list here, can you give those an, an priority of, of uh, when they'll happen, or rank, rank them in some degree, or maybe you cannot do that? On, on, you can obviously touch and cook time of your. Yeah. So, so we can't do that. So what the minister asked us to do back in, in June was to you know, work at pace to continue to develop these. So uh, we've done that. Uh, ultimately, it will be for the Minister to prioritise these, as I said earlier, in line with her funding envelope and her other priorities. So, so um, John, if they are all, all, for example, the same value cost, for example, what would indicate to the Minister which would be get priority? Give me what examples which would prioritise those five. So that would be the, minister, that would be the Minister's uh, decision. Uh, but what would weigh it up for her? Uh, well, you know, ultimately, it's a political decision. So it's not based on volumes of cars. It's well, political. well, well, Philip, you can help me here, but you know, the, each scheme will have a cost-benefit analysis, yeah, yeah. right? So you, you know, if you, if you wanted to rank a scheme, you could do it in cost-benefit analysis. So the minister will look at a range of factors and, and make a decision on it. Um, I think yes, there there are various things that will feed into. Uh, the, the positives or, or negatives about any scheme. There are several of those schemes on the list are, are bypasses there, mm. and that, that generally is seen as, as a positive for a town uh, in, in that it uh, frees up the town centre. Others will see it as a, a negative for a town, so, so, yeah, so in, a town. in that people bypass it. 
Um, so there's, there's, there's various criteria there. I mean, the minister, one of the minister's <coughs> aims is to improve connectivity uh, and, um, across the, the region as a whole. Um, and, well, all of those schemes will, will achieve that. And final question, Don or, or, or Philip, when do you see Cookstown coming on her table to make the call? Well, Cookstown um, is actually one of, at the earlier stages of development, as far as those few schemes are concerned, um, where it, it had set an abeyance for a number of years. It was picked up again uh, because of the amount of time that had passed. We're reviewing the environmental aspects of it and ensuring that we're, we've got the correct preferred route. So we would propose um, to come forward with a preferred route uh, in the first quarter of next year. Um, so the Minister would be making an announcement on that. Um, some of the work that we've done as part of the review will help us in the next stage. So by the end of the 2021-22 financial year, uh, we would probably be in a position to come forward with draft statutory orders. So Cookstown is not just as advanced as some of the schemes that we've talked about. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have four members have indicated and with 10 minutes. Mr. Muir. I promise to be brief. <laughs> Uh, so I had three questions. I'll just do two. Uh, the first one was on the A1, the junctions to phase two, which Liz has already raised. I think it's a, probably the most important project, I think, of all of these from a safety perspective. Mm -hmm. How long would you envisage the procurement process taking place if that was given the green light? So the process as a whole would, would probably take about 24 months, up to 24 months in terms of uh, if the minister makes a positive decision on, on the A1, um, preparation of contract documents and so forth, and then the actual tender process itself, you're probably looking at about 24 months. Um, and the other one's just in relation, I've already declared, previously worked for Transit, <coughs> but in relation to BRT phase two, whereabouts is that? Because I know that that actually, the whole processes of getting approvals and getting them in place can take quite a while and it requires a lot of engagement. So um, quite a lot of work has been done on that. Um, uh, we've engaged consultants, uh, who consulting engineers, uh, uh, who have been doing a feasibility and options appraisal. So um, <coughs> as you'll know, this route is proposed to go from the south of Belfast through the city centre to the north of Belfast. So they've been looking, modelling, looking at numbers and various things, and with a view to moving towards uh, a preferred option to present to the minister, probably uh, January, well, maybe February uh, uh, of next year, uh, uh, and subject to the minister's view on this, uh, I think it would be anticipated there be a wider stakeholder consultation uh, uh, to continue to develop the project. But uh, it's quite a significant amount of work has been done in the background, uh, and it will start to come to fruition. Uh, early next year. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Anderson. Good morning, good, um, John and Philip. Um, a submission is being prepared for the minister for the A5 for to make a, a decision. When would you get that? So it's uh, it's with the minister at the minute. So uh, she has it. We've given her advice, and um, uh, it will be. We're just waiting on the minister to make a decision. Yes, so. Okay. Um, can I ask about the A6, because I'm a bit concerned, the second phase from Derry to Dungiven, yeah. uh, from the call to yeah. Uh That's progressing, you're saying, through the statutory process, but it's not, not currently, this is what's concerning me, not currently planned to advance to construction. Now, I am conscious of the Maboy, uh, which is as big as a legal dump uh, in Europe, and they're saying this part of this work encroaches upon that. Is that why? It's not planning. It's not being prepared for construction. No, no well, that's the, 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 are they both separate? Sorry, two separate issues. Well, they're, they're, so let, let's take it one at a time. Um, so the the, the A six scheme uh, from Derry to Dungiven uh, all went through one inquiry, uh, and uh, as a result of that, the drama to call section has got uh, essentially a preferred route. Uh, uh, but that has not been that was not developed further because the previous minister or ministers and I can't remember if it was one or both one or two uh, set the priorities for Randallstown, Castle Dawson, and then Drumahoe to 
uh, to, from Dungiven to Drumahoe. So uh, it, it was a, a, a priority issue. Um, clearly, uh, the, the, the road encroaches on the waste site, and that will be a factor as, as you know, if and when we start to develop this further. Is that it, fair it, enough? It, it will be. I mean, as you're probably aware, uh, that there is a strategy being developed by DERA to, to deal with, with the waste site, um, and we await that with interest. So do I. Um, just finally, one quick question. I, I'll come back on the A2 at another time. New procurement board established. The <laughs> minister has announced that. So, social value champion in the uh, in the department. Is there any plans to have a social value champion, given the amount of infrastructure <coughs> that's going to take place in the department's role in that? It's going to be very important that we have social clauses in procurement contracts. So, um, the minister of finance nominated me for the procurement board, and. Uh, uh, I, You're the person we need to make sure that there's social value. I, I listened and read Hansard uh, with, with interest about social value, yeah. and that's clearly something we'll be focused on, and it's something that me, as a representative of the board and a representative of the department, will be uh, engaging at to you know to address. So clearly, it's it's a it's a focus for the Minister of Finance, and it's something we'll have to to. to, to but take Chair, forward. I think that's something that we'll come back to because I think the committee would like to know about apprenticeships and the long-term unemployed and how we use social value and procurement contracts. Yep, to it's, all that. it's clearly a, a, an issue that uh, uh, we'll need to take forward. Uh, the, the first board is actually uh, next Wednesday, I think. Thank you, and I might add, if members don't get all their questions asked, that um, certainly um, via the clerk we can send okay. it to yourself. So, m Mr. Bags. Uh, very briefly, um, again, you're aware of litigation happening in London over uh, the death of a young child with asthma over the pollution levels. So my question is, are we directing our funding towards reducing, uh, app appropriately to reduce p pollution levels uh, in particular areas where there's con heavy congestion, such as York Gate? So. Taking in the round, the, the regional strategic network transport plan will, uh, you know, one of the you know, one of the strategic objectives will be linked to uh, air quality and climate change. So, uh, you know, looking to the future, it it will be a factor uh, in how we develop you know, strategic plans within the department, and that's uh, you know, roads and transport interventions. Uh, Clearly, it's a focus of the minister. Climate change and air quality is a focus of the minister. You know, uh, she's very focused on, and we've talked about park and ride, but walking, cycling to reduce levels of uh, traffic. And the result of that then is reduced uh, levels of congestion and better air quality. And I think everybody will have seen from the lockdown, you know, that that, that you know the sky was bluer. Yeah. So there's obviously, you know, it, it's it's a, a just traffic clearly. So the minister is focused on this, and, and, and looking forward in terms of strategic planning, the, the transport plan will uh, address it, address this as you know one of its uh, key uh, key drivers or key indicators. Again, you've mentioned in terms of uh, road development funding is, is an issue, uh, and in terms of that funding, how do you determine? The proportion of money that's going towards capital build and the proportion that's spent on maintenance. So, working your way down from monies allocated, so there's bidding and, and allocations, uh, but so bidding from the department to the Department of Finance, and then monies allocated back, and then the minister then determines the allocations within the department. Just, just to be clear. Uh, when road resurfacing occurs, which stops the potholes and all, all yeah. the claims, etc., is that deemed, which, which will last for probably 20 years, I mean, it's, that's the sort of frequency of resurfacing, is that capital or is that resource funding? So I just want to go back uh, just to clarify a point. So when the money comes from um, DOF, it is actually there, it's, it's, there's capital and resource, and then the minister allocates it below that. So in terms of um, uh, filling potholes. No, in terms uh, of resurfacing, so major resurfacing. Ma major resurfacing, resurfacing is capital. Okay. So therefore, there's a choice between 
resurfacing our roads and stopping potholes and building new roads. So, reducing capital limited capital so, funds. So filling potholes is actually resource. Mm. Yeah, okay. yeah, but resurfacing. Resurfacing is capital. Potholes. So your point maybe is that you, you you would have a choice about resurfacing versus a new scheme, a new capital yeah. scheme. That, that, yes, that is a choice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Well, it comes to this stage. There's very little left to say, <laughs> except I would support um, um, Mr. Boyd in, when that, in, in relation to the Mid Southwest. I do think there's significant potential within that document, and there's a, a lack of recognition on the importance of the area, which does over 20% of the exports in, uh, in Northern Ireland in terms of manufactured goods and agri food sector. So I do think we will be coming back to that document, which the committee received and referred to the department at some date in the future. So I'll leave it to them. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we've more or less covered Everybody. most constituencies and most, <laughs> most games. So Rail link. Can, can I thank you and apologies again for how hasty we've had to yeah. go through this, this session. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but um, no doubt we'll be meeting again um, in the not too distant future. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And if members do have um, sort of additional questions that they would like to ask, certainly they can be facilitated through the clerk. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks, thank you. John thank and Philip. <coughs> thanks. Okay, um, moving then to forward work programme, just draw your attention to that. So for next week we have an additional briefing and officials have um, agreed and are available um, to discuss the taxi support scheme next week. So that will be in addition to the departmental briefing on common frameworks. And during that briefing I think we can deal with apologies. We can deal with the SL1 at, at that point as well because yep. yeah. um, Graham Banks will be there for that session on that. And also we have the January monitoring round. Yep. Uh, yes, and in order to facilitate that, that was really the sting in the tail, was that if um, we may have to start at 9.30, so members <laughs> have to do that. Okay, that's um, no problem. <laughs> no good. Right, right, I have to personal group mm -hmm. right there as a member with the uh, taxi gentlemen that were here and whatnot and stuff. Are we having a look again at the taxi driver situation and a potential maybe window opening up for well, 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 low percentage of? Well, I think <coughs> what, we, what we were what we had agreed was that we would have the officials to come up to talk about the, the scheme. So I think um, officials probably need to be prepared to discuss the issues that are are pertinent to drivers and, and also operators. to the operators. Yeah. So just as some of those drivers, as has been said here. Time in the last couple of hours, it's coming towards Christmas, and it's another week going yeah. down the tubes. Well, I suppose the concern was that if we were to write today, we may not get a response until we come back in January. So, um, in order to move it on, if we brought them up for yeah. next week, and hopefully in the interim, that's not to stop them actually then um, bringing forward solutions during that time. Yeah. But certainly, I think from this com committee's perspective, at least, if we're, we're, we're we've asked them to come, um, and we can then. Um, ask the appropriate questions um, but hopefully they may have a solution in advance of that members i'm, I'm just concerned okay. next uh wednesday they may come up maybe there's not a solution presented to us we all leave here all of those drivers and operate in the mouth of christmas so if the, i i don't know that there if there's any mechanism open to this committee to try to do something Monday and Tuesday in the chamber. I, I just don't know. I just don't think we can leave it until Wednesday, unless we knew they were coming up to inform us that there were some solutions that they had found to deal with the difficulties. But if it's just going to be explained to us why they were doing what they're doing, that's what I'm concerned about. Yeah, you do urgent oral. Do urgent oral. Yeah. Do urgent oral. Is there one that can go in from the committee or something like that? Committee urgent oral. Ah, committee urgent oral. Yeah. I don't think there's don't a facility think for an well, committee one, one then. We'll, 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 we can explore that over the next I, uh, I think if so. we should, under is there any exceptional circumstances that given the time frame that it may be the last committee meeting and we're not going to have time to resolve it, my concern is we're just going to come up and give an explanation as to why things we'll were done. We'll ask if the clerk can speak to the business office just to see a mechanism is for any for something you in could, relation to in that. The um, it has okay. to be, it would have to be laid in a, an individual member's name. Yeah, that's it. Okay, um, mm. moving then to any other business, I probably have generally covered that, unless there's something else anyone has wished to raise. Okay, I just advise you then to maintain your social distancing as you leave. To 
fill your own papers, um, etc., etc. And we will be meeting here next Wednesday at 9:30, Wednesday, 16th of December, in the Senate Chamber. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.